Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Um, this is series number four um, out of five of Dr. Ergen's um, presentation trainings. Uh, today we're going to be covering um, how to navigate uh, how to navigate uh, schools. And I'm sorry if I'm saying the uh, the title incorrect, but this is again series number four and it's um, how to navigate school when you have a child with the FASD advocacy special education issue, virtual le uh, learning tips, again, number four of five. Um, you will not be able to receive CEs for attending by phone. Again, you will not be able to receive CEs for attending by phone. Um, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few general housekeeping rules. Um, for full attendance, you will be awarded three hours. If you exit the session early, your hours or your credits will be prorated. Um, in order to receive proper credit from your board's discipline, you have to provide your license number when you registered. If you did not do so, please feel free to send an email um, to the MHAS FASD mailbox. Uh, after the se uh, session ends, you will receive a survey link by email. I will come sometime within an hour. We hope you participate and we appreciate your feedback as soon as possible. Um, everyone should receive their participation certificate within seven business days. If you have any questions or concerns regarding uh, your registration and or your CE's um, accreditation, please feel free to again email me at the FASD uh, email box. And lastly, um, all participants will stay on mute and we ask that you enter all questions during the presentation in the platform question box. And next up is the FASD program manager, Karen. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Karen Kimbrough, and I am the Maternal Wellness Project Lead at Ohio Moss. Welcome. We apologize for getting started a little late. We had some technical difficulties we had to work out. We um, appreciate your patience and um, respect your time. Uh, Char already did the um, title of this presentation. The objectives are participants will be able to identify the educational experiences of students with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. The second objective is participants will be able to identify school-based interventions, accommodations, and virtual tips for students with FASD. And the third objective is participants will be able to gain basic knowledge of special education laws, special education advocacy, parents as special education advocates, and tips for communicating with the school system. We welcome you to this presentation and the next person that will introduce um, Dr. Ergen is Tracy Jackson. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gocha Ergen, an associate professor and a licensed clinical psychologist at the School of Professional Psychology at Wright State University. She has a master's degree in clinical psychology and an APA approved doctoral degree in school psychology. She completed an APA approved internship at the University of Minnesota Medical School and Children's Hospital. Her teaching interests are cognitive assessment, child assessment, and neuropsychology of affect and behavior. Clinical interests include infant and toddler assessment, pediatric neuropsychological assessment, psychoeducational assessment, school psychology, school consultation, treatment of externalizing and internalizing disorders of childhood, parent training, assessment and treatment of developmental disabilities, including autism spe spectrum disorder and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, and prenatal drug and alcohol exposure. She is a member of American Psychological Association, including Division 40 and National Association of School Psychologists. Now I will hand it over to Bonnie to introduce our second presenter. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Bonnie Hubbard Nicosia and I work for the Ohio Department of Medicaid. I'm also a member of the FASD State Steering Committee and I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Introduce Addie Jeff Jeffs. Addie earned a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is currently a second year doctoral student at Wright State University School of Professional Psychology, and she's pursuing a doctorate of psychology with an emphasis in children. Her professional and clinical interests include neurodevelop neurodevelopmental disorders, 
trauma-informed care, assessment and treatment of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, and school-based interventions for children and adolescents. Addie recently presented research on the assessment and treatment of child sexual abuse in children with developmental disabilities, and she completed a training on trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. And now I'm turning it over to Dr. Aragon to start the presentation. Thank you very much, Bonnie and Karen and Char for all the introductions and the housekeeping. So um, welcome everyone. Um, I'm very excited to launch the, our, um, our fourth training um, in our series today, where we'll be talking about the, um, the educational piece regarding um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. But, um, you know, we wish that we could be, you know, um, more face to face, but um, you know we can't uh, at this point. But we wanted to kind of like share um, a little bit, kind of like uh, some fun facts about um, each of us. So I'll get started, and then I'll give the turn to um, to Addie. So just to kind of um, get to know each other a little bit more. Um, well, um, I'm from Turkey originally, and uh, I've come uh, to US um, 20 years ago. And uh, one fun fact is that um, the first time I visited the United States was when I was um, 20. And um, that time I went to LA uh, where my cousin lives in, uh, in Hollywood and works there. And there I met Samuel L. Jackson. So that was such a big thing for me. And I thought, okay, the whole you know, US is like that because that's what people not living in US kind of like think about. And then when I came back, um, after six years after that, um, to complete my doctoral studies, um, I happened to come to Mount Pleasant, Michigan. I don't know if there is any of you from Michigan, but Mount Pleasant is a very small city in the uh, closer to the Upper Peninsula uh, in Michigan, a very rural area. And then I thought like, okay, these are quite different places um, in the two different parts of the, of the country. So that's kind of like a you know, fun fact about me. And then we also wanted to share um, a fun fact again about, uh, because we've all been in this pandemic all together and what we have um, gained or learned um, during this time. Um, so one thing is that I love uh, cooking Turkish food and I think I'm a pretty good cook, but I've never been a good baker. But once we started the lockdown, you know, I think in social media, we've all seen everyone do all these breads and different things and baking at home. And I thought, well, maybe I could start and do that too, because now we're at home. And uh, I started that process. I just want to share that I'm still a horrible baker. Nothing has changed. So, but um, on the other hand, I found this new love of uh, nature and doing long walks. And um, I also found this um, hobby of taking really nice um, nature pictures of the beautiful Ohio sky and the trees and you know different animals that I see around. So that's a little bit about me uh, and some fun facts. Addie? Yes, can you hear me, Dr. Aragon? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, and I apologize everybody. My webcam is experiencing some difficulties. So for now, I'm gonna just be on audio um, and I apologize about that. Um, but I'm originally from North Carolina. Um, so the fun fact about me is that I love beaches and the water. And when I moved up to Ohio for my doctoral studies, I realized that there's not a lot of water in Ohio. I'm not able to hear you, Addie. Oh. No beaches, um, just a couple lakes and creeks and things like that. So I try to find water anywhere I can. Um, and none of my family lives in Ohio. So I was able to spend a lot more time with them, which I really appreciated. And then similarly to Dr. Ergoon, I was able to explore um, a lot more of the nature around me in Ohio that I hadn't been able to do because I was so busy with studies and things like that, just allowed for more time to explore some of the nature, not the beach, but you know, some of the other really cool parks and forests and things like that around Ohio. So that's just a little bit about. Thank you, Addie, for um, sharing your new interests and um, some fun facts. So um, Karen already went through the um, learning objectives. So 
I'd like to go ahead and get started about the educational experiences of our students with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So I'd like to start our presentation today um, with uh, where we kind of like left off. So in my previous webinars, if you were able to follow them, I talked about what is FASD. Um, just a very quick, quick lead, FASD is a neurodevelopmental disorder, um, and it's a um, umbrella term that um, kind of explains the disorders that happen as a result of prenatal alcohol exposure. And it's a quite prevalent disorder, around two to five percent, both in U.S. and uh, in other parts of the of the world. So, um, when an individual um, has been diagnosed with FASD, so this is where I'd like to get started with that, because again, in my other webinars, I talked about what does um, symptoms look like, what do red flags look like. Um, what do treatments for FASD look like, and then what is the diagnostic process for FASD? But now let's think about this scenario where, um, or circumstances where a family has a child who has just been diagnosed with FASD and you have a report as a parent in your hand or you are a professional and your client has been diagnosed with FASD or you are a teacher or a school staff and one of your students has been diagnosed with FASD. So that's where I'd like to start up today's presentation. So, um, what do we do after that? Where do we go? How do we move forward? Okay, so that's where I'd like to open up our presentation. So first of all, I'd like to talk about um, where are we in the educational system in our knowledge of FASD, and then what would a student with FASD look like in the classroom? So that's where I'd like to um, get started with. So first of all, a student with FASD um, would have uh, variable cognitive skills, okay? So unlike a child with an intellectual disability, a child with an FASD is on a spectrum, just like is in an autism spectrum, meaning that the way they present is going to be quite variable. So not one child with FASD is going to look like another child with FASD in the classroom. Some will have intellectual disabilities, some will have lower cognitive skills, some will have average, and some will have above average intellectual functioning, okay? So therefore, if you see a child who is average in IQ, we should not really say, oh, this child does not have a disability, because that's not true, because there are many other things that students with disabilities do struggle with, and I'd like to highlight those today. Another um, fact that we should know is that not all of the children with FASD have facial features. And in my other presentations, I detailed them, I showed pictures. There are certain facial features that a student with FASD uh, would have. However, not all of the children with FASD get diagnosed with what we call fetal alcohol syndrome, where children will have specific facial features. However, only a subset of individuals with FASD will have the full phenotype of the FAS, and therefore only few or some of them will show the facial features. So unlike Down syndrome, where all of the children with Down syndrome, regardless of their abilities, they all have that facial feature that's characteristics of Down syndrome, but that is not the case for FASD. So if we see a child who does not have facial features, we should not say, oh, this child does not have a disability or struggles. Okay? Um, and then another piece is that, um, so those are the couple two things that we need to keep in mind. But then what do they all have in common? What they all have in common is that they all have some sort of learning difficulties, which I'll explain later. They all have some sort of behavioral problems and they all struggle with daily living skills or communication or social skills, okay? They also have a lot of difficulties with what we call executive functioning skills, which is their ability to plan and organize. So they all struggle with that, which definitely get in the way for their ability to um, do well in class. They will also have, all of them will have problems with learning new information and remembering that new information. And also they will have struggles with 
integrating the information and generalizing one information to another context. Okay, so um, all in all, what I'm trying to convey is that not one student with FASD will look like the other one. Okay, therefore, we should think more flexibly. We should kind of like um, be open and then kind of like trying to understand what are the areas that they are struggling with. So um, I mentioned about some of these difficulties. So now I'm going to go into specific details and try to kind of uh, let you know if you have a child in your class with FASD, what should you expect? Or if you are a parent and your child has been diagnosed with FASD, what kind of difficulties should you expect them to have uh, in the classroom or in the school context? And why should we know about these? Well, as Addy will nicely explain later on, parents would be the best advocates for their children. And I could see or maybe hear some of you already thinking who are already parents um, that, yes, I was the best advocate or I am the best advocate for my child because I know my child the best. And that's absolutely true. So in the area of cognitive difficulties, what we should expect is that the average cognitive, um, where cognitively the children are with FASD are in that borderline range. Borderline meaning that it is a little bit below the average range, but it's not quite there for intellectual disability. So this is the average. But having said that, as I said before, some of our children will be within the intellectual disability range, some will be, most will be within that borderline range, some will be average, and some be, will be a little bit above the average range. So therefore, we see this variability of cognitive functioning. Another area that we would see is memory difficulties. So how would these difficulties show in class and what does that mean? So um, first of all, they would have a lot of difficulty learning new information. That means, uh, for example, today, um, you know, we're talking about some new information that you might not have heard. Some of you might not have heard. So what we're doing is that we're taking in and in and in this information and you're trying to relate it with other information that you have learned. So this is called that initial encoding of that information. So students with FASD have a lot of difficulties with that initial learning. They can learn but they can learn small chunks of information at a time. And if they are overloaded with information, that information will very quickly decay and they will forget. So there is a lot of decaying of information and it will be forgotten very easily. So that's one area. So then uh, we could see that the teachers like um, then could some find some ways to provide the information in smaller chunks more frequently and making sure that they do not forget it by working on a lot of rehearsal and repetition. Another area that they would struggle in is what we call working memory. Working memory is when um, we have to learn the information, the incoming information, and hold it in our head and then provide an answer. Okay, so just as an example, if I tell you this, I'm going to tell you some numbers and letters. And when I'm done, I want you to say the numbers first, okay, in order, going from lower to higher. And then I would like you to say um, the letters in an alphabetical order, okay? So, you ready? I'll just say an example. So, if we say something like um, 3B1C, okay? So, then we have to put one and three first, and then we then we have to do B and C, right? So this is an example of working memory. So we get the information, then we reorder it in our heads and then give it back. Well, Bandi, you might say like Dr. Ergen, we don't do these kinds of things in class. How is it relevant in class? Well, it's really relevant in class because in class, we are not asking to students to repeat things all the time. We're asking them to learn it and then manipulated in their heads related to some other material and then when the teacher asks back again then they have to say it back if they cannot hold the information in there or manipulate the information that information is quickly gone and they cannot relate it to what they have learned 
And then some of the complaints or the difficulties that we hear from the teachers is that, oh, this student, Jane, you know, is not, you know, every time we teach it, we go over it. I think that she gets it. But when I asked a question, it's not there. So this is due to the specific memory difficulties that students with FASD have. Um, another area that they struggle is what we call confabulation or intrusion. What do these big words mean for those of you who may not have heard? Um, what this means is that because there are memory uh, impairments, memory difficulties, which is due to the exposure of alcohol in the brain before the baby is born, it impacts those specific areas. Um, memory, there are memory gaps, okay? And intrusion means that because the child has these memory gaps, the brain tries to fill in those gaps and they kind of like come up with information that is not true. So that could look like that either they are fabricating things, they're lying, or they're just saying things that don't make sense. None of those are true because this is due to the brain almost trying so hard to fill in the blanks of the memory gaps. Okay. So let's say um, you were very sleepless and fatigued and um, you had a hard day yesterday. And today somebody's asking you at work about a meeting and because you couldn't pay attention, you just struggle and you just say like, um, we did this and, oh, I can't quite remember, but I think it was this. So really our brain is trying to fill in the details, but we're having struggling hard time, you know, having a hard time with that. So that's what happens to our students with FASD. So then what the teacher can see is that they are saying things, uh, they remember things, but they're either wrong, they're not on point, uh, they remember the wrong thing, and um, sometimes it's just so irrelevant. And the teacher might get frustrated with the student, the student might get frustrated with the teacher because the student might say, well, I'm giving you the answer, so what's wrong? And then they get, get frustrated, dysregulated, and lash out. So a lot of these memory difficulties also lead to behavioral difficulties and struggles and disruptive behaviors at school uh, because they get uh, frustrated because they cannot get the correct answer. So on the other hand, our students with FASD have a lot of strengths in memory too. So what are those strengths? Those strengths are in the area of what we call uh, repetition, so short-term memory. If you tell them, repeat after me, and say one, nine, six, three. They can go ahead and repeat after that. Unless they have to manipulate it, they're good with that. They can repeat the information. So for the short term, they have a pretty good memory. So we can rely on that memory. And another thing that they're really good at is what we call implicit memory or procedural memory, which means um, this is a type of memory that we call muscle memory. Like when we remember to how to make a sandwich, we remember how to drive once we learn, how to, how to um, drive a bike, ride a bike. Uh, we would remember how to play tennis or golf after we have learned it. So these are the things that they do well and they can remember and they would have no problems remembering this type of information. So this has implications uh, because they could do quite well in some of the tasks or jobs uh, in vocational training, or we could use these strengths to circumvent some of the other memory difficulties. Um, another area that they might struggle in is what we call executive functioning skills. So executive functioning skills is housed in the frontal lobe of our brain, which is kind of like our CEO of our brain. It kind of like manages us. So this is when uh, we are able to plan, organize, initiate activities, engage in problem solving, go from one task to another, which we call cognitive flexibility. So uh, think about the time when you had to plan your um, daughter's or son's graduation, when you had to plan your own wedding. What did we do? We had to plan, organize, think about tasks, order them, and then uh, set small goals, right? So our students with FASD have a lot of difficulties with executive functioning skills. So what does that mean for the classroom? What that means is that when a teacher gives an assignment and says it's due in two weeks, well, the student has to write it down and then come up with initial tasks to do, figuring out what, you know, uh, what they need to do for that assignment. Do they need to get a poster? 
Do they need to talk with their friends? Do they need to look back at their notes? So they have to plan and organize and then make sure that they're also on time to submit it, right? So these type of tasks are extremely hard for our students with FASD. And they also struggle with what we call problem solving. They struggle with finding um, solutions to problems. So they may find one solution, but when the teacher says, um, that's what I hear a lot from these days from my daughter's uh, math teacher, she comes and says, mom, I need to find another way to solve this problem. And I go like, okay, well, let's think through. So this is generating different ways to solve a problem because that's how a lot of the concepts at school are learned and taught. So our children with FASD might struggle with finding alternate solutions to a specific problem in which might limit their ability to approach a certain um, problem and concept. So all of these, because they don't have that uh, CEO kind of like working really well, they usually could rely on parents to help. And at school, they could rely on teachers to help or an aide to help with them. And once they get that kind of help, they will be able to um, succeed much better within the school environment. Um, what do we expect in the area of language difficulties? Well, first of all, a lot of the kids with FASD, if their FASD is not in the severe uh, spectrum, then they can talk, they can understand. So their basic language skills seems to be intact, meaning average range. Um, but if they have what we call fetal alcohol syndrome, they could also have expressive or receptive language disorder, meaning that they might have a hard time with comprehension or speaking or articulation. But if we don't have those, we could see a traditional, you know, FAS student with FASD in the classroom speaking, conversing freely, understanding basic things. But then you might say, then where are the difficulties? What should the teacher expect? Well, what the teacher should expect is that when the lecture that the teacher gives or when the instruction that the teacher gives is complex, when it's not, uh, when it's abstract, when it's not concrete, then that's when the student with FASD will start to struggle. They will have a hard time understanding more complex information and the more abstract it gets, then the more uh, frustrating that is for our um, student with FASD. Okay, so those are some of the things that we could definitely expect uh, within the classroom in terms of language difficulties. So then putting all of these together, how do all of these um, primary symptoms show uh, within the classroom as an academic difficulty? Well, first and foremost, um, and I've again talked about this in some of my other webinars, is that our students with FASD struggle immensely in the area of math skills. Well, math is comprised of calculation, problem solving, having that cognitive flexibility, engaging in really abstract concepts, right? We have to learn about all of these equations and which comes after that. We have to learn about some of the math terms. They're all abstract. There is not a whole lot that we can, you know, apply as much as the concepts get even harder, right? So, um, and then um, we have to engage in problem solving. Now, let's think through all the struggles that I've mentioned before. And then let's think about what math requires. Can you kind of put the link, make the link? Our students with FASG struggle with abstraction, problem solving, cognitive flexibility, understanding um, abstract concepts. Well, and therefore, because they struggle in those, they struggle specifically in math, okay? Reading doesn't require as much of that. You can learn to read. They're pretty good with reading, um, you know, learning to read and word reading, reading sentences and so forth. But where they struggle is getting the meaning, extracting the meaning out of it. So they can read and learn to read well, but they might struggle more in the comprehension area which is understanding what that text specifically means, okay? So then that's where we could see them struggle more. So the first grade, second grade, it's not reading about meaning. It's more making sure you can decode, you can sound out words, you learn your uh, flashcards and all the sight words. 
But then come third grade and so forth, then we could start our students with FAST start to struggle specifically in the area of reading comprehension. Okay? Another area that they might struggle in is in writing skills. Um, some of our students with FASD will have fine motor skills and gross motor skill difficulties, and that could show in the area of writing. Um, they might be better and good with spelling skills, but when it comes to writing essays, what does writing essays require or writing, um, you know, compositions? Well, it requires integration. It requires comprehension of information. And it requires generalization a little bit, right? So, and these are all of the skills that our students with FASD more specifically struggle with. And therefore, when it comes to writing essays and compositions, putting things together, then we need to show them ways how it can be broken down into. Because also executive functioning skills go much into writing uh, essays. Because we have to first plan, right? pre-plan our writing. We have to say, these are the bullet points that I'm going to write about. Then I'm going to expand on the beginning, the middle part, introduction, the middle part, and then the end. So it requires really having that goal-directed behavior. And we know that our students with FASD have significant executive functioning deficits, which will definitely play out in the writing skills. And then the other two areas that our students with FASD struggle is money management and telling time. Telling time is a very abstract thing. You know, they can tell time on a digital clock, but an analog clock is going to be really difficult. So one compensation recommendation would be to use a digital clock. And of course, keep on working on telling time. But if you see that as a teacher, as a parent, um, I just want you to be aware of that. And then the other area is money management. Money is again very you know, um, abstract concept. Learning about the worth of coins, how much uh, change should you get back? Those are the things that um, they would definitely um, struggle with. So making money learning skills very concrete, same with the telling time, you know, would be really, really helpful in the classroom uh, for them to learn. Of course, um, telling time, money management, they are not just things we learn in school, right? We use them consistently throughout life. It's a daily living skill. It's an adaptive um, tasks because without managing our money, our budget, it's very hard to live independently. And without telling time, knowing time, we will be late for appointments. We'll be um, you know, late for work and other things. So those are really the two things that I think uh, our students with FASD, we could put a lot more emphasis on just to make sure that they acquire these uh, life skills as well. In the area of behavioral difficulties, um, our students with FASD will struggle a lot with being impulsive. So what happens in class then? They're gonna be the ones who tap on the shoulder of another friend. Uh, they will want to grab things from maybe um, some of their peers, and that could cause issues with peers. They could be the ones who will get up from their seat, similar to our kids with ADHD, and they be very hyperactive because 70% of our kids with FASD will also have ADHD. They can also engage in disruptive behaviors and aggression within the school environment, and that's usually as a result of dysregulation or self-regulation issues. Anything can set them off, such as being frustrated with the schoolwork. Uh, it could be a too much of an overwhelming environment. They could have problems with transition from one activity or from one class to another. So all of these kind of put together um, would have um, issues in that, you know, being dysregulated. And when they are dysregulated, they might have a meltdown. And the meltdown would result in either lashing out to other students, to teachers, to other school staff. So these are some of the things that we could expect uh, or see within the school environment. And of course, I could hear some of you, maybe even the parents saying like, yeah, this is the area that we struggled the most. And as a result of this, we found our children to be uh, having disciplinary actions very frequently within the school. But I think if we understand the function as to why they might be lashing out, I think that would really help us to advocate for our children. It's not because they want to disrupt the class. 
it's not because um, they just want to be, you know, either mean or aggressive towards other peers. It, the underlying issues we need to find, determine and assess, and then cater to their needs to minimize those uh, areas that kind of trigger these dysregulation um, issues. In the area of social difficulties, um, we have difficulty with taking the perspective of others. So this could play a big role in peer relationships because they could have hard time reading their cues, their nonverbal cues. If the teacher is engaging maybe in humor sometimes, in lecture time, that could be a difficulty. While everybody is, you know, maybe enjoying that humor, they might miss um, some of that on that. Um, and then sometimes they could be overly friendly to peers and uh, they might have a hard time differentiating who is a really good friend and who is just an acquaintance. So they might go to a friend who they might call like, I'm friends with them. Uh, this is my best friend, but maybe the other peer is not thinking the same way. So that could cause issues that could lead to bullying or being bullied. So uh, definitely uh, in the social area, a great question to always ask, um, you know, as a parent maybe to your child, or if you're a teacher, making sure to check in the recess, in the lunchtime, in the classroom time to make sure that how are the social skills? Are they being bullied, teased, um, taken advantage of? Because those are also some of the things that might happen due to the social gullibility of a child with FASD. And they also want to please others, including peers. So therefore, sometimes they could be in positions where peers uh, might try to take advantage of them. So frequent checking from both the parent side and the teacher side to make sure that the bullying and teasing and taking advantage, those are the things that are not happening. And if so, engaging in those anti-bullying you know, interventions and making sure that um, they will be paired with a buddy meaning that um, paired with a maybe a student who is not struggling socially so that they could model some of those behaviors and they can learn to engage in prosocial behaviors. In the area of emotional difficulties, um, I mentioned about the dysregulation, right? The dysregulation seems to be the underlying piece. It's not that our students inherently have uh, mood disorders. Mood disorders could appear later on if that's maybe genetically in the family or um, if they develop it due to other reasons. But inherently, mood dysregulation is a result of the self dysregulation and it's due to the impact of the alcohol in the brain. So those are two different things. Sometimes uh, when I do my assessments, I get a lot of referrals and the children have already been diagnosed with bipolar and depression and everything under the earth regarding mood disorders. Well, when I look at more specifically, what I see is that yes, the mood is changing. That's what we call the mood swings. One time it's great and all of a sudden we have a meltdown. Uh, one time you have good relationships, all of a sudden you're trying to, you know, you're starting to argue. So lots of temper tantrums and meltdowns. But what I usually see is that the underlying function is the uh, sensory difficulties, the dysregulation that kind of like comes up pretty easily. And if we do not check with our children, whether we are a teacher or a parent or professional working with our students with FASD, where is your engine? Your engine meaning like, what about your you know, emotions? Where are you? How are you feeling? Is your engine running you know, low? So maybe you need to be uh, activated a little bit. Is your engine running high, meaning that we need to bring it down? Or is your engine okay at this point? So um, using some of the self-regulation you know, techniques, um, then we can kind of like check on to see what those emotional difficulties are. But having said that, it doesn't mean that our children with FASD will not develop depression or anxiety or emotional difficulties, especially when they pass through the childhood years and start entering teenage years. This is a time, uh, and if those of you working with that population, as a teacher, parent, or a professional, you really need to ask questions about depression, anxiety, because this is the time when they start feeling more alienated from others. They start realizing that they might be different than others, that they're learning more differently than others. 
And this is a time they might get maybe more bullied or teased. So then what happens is that they started feeling more defeated. They may start having a low self-esteem, which could all lead to depression, anxiety, and sometimes suicidal ideation. So we have to make sure that we check in regarding suicidal ideation, any thoughts, and making sure that we keep also our children um, safe during this time. So um, then why did we talk about, why did I talk about this first segment? And how is that related to school? Well, first of all, school is a wonderful place. School is a wonderful place to learn, to socialize, to learn from adults, uh, from the teachers, from the wonderful teachers that, um, you know, that are out there. However, if the educational experience of a student with FASD is not positive, okay, then we start seeing uh, a lot of um, academic achievement problems, a lot of behavioral problems, which could get in the way of their success within the educational system. And therefore, it would result in what we call disrupted schooling. Disrupted schooling means that they will more tend to drop out out of school. The more they stay in school, of course, the better is for the prognosis, right? The more they stay in school, the more they stay away from alcohol and drug use, the less they will have mental health problems, uh, less contact they will have with the criminal justice system. Um, they will engage in more appropriate you know, sexual behaviors because they will keep learning about that through modeling. And then they will have, will have less challenges with um, independent living and employment in the future. So our goal then uh, should be really to provide a very positive school experience for our students with FASD so that their um, experience is not disrupted by dropout. But unfortunately, at this point, and that's why we're talking about this today, uh, a lot of children uh, are experiencing dropout rate. It's a, it's a really, really high rate. Um, therefore, um, it means that we're not doing something right. And this is by no means, the, the whole um, goal of this presentation is by no means of any kind of blame it's, or anything regarding the schools. Um, I very much enjoy so far my you know, daughter's schooling experiences. Uh, we had very positive experiences. I hear it from many, many parents that school is just a wonderful, wonderful place for their children to be educated. And I'm a school psychologist by training. I worked a lot in the schools and um, Eddie's uh, area of interest is within the schools as well. So uh, we love working within the schools. So our goal is just to highlight what are we missing at this point and how can we remediate this? So if we can provide a positive school environment, then it leads to a really good prognosis, which um, some of the, uh, the leads to the protective factors. So if a child is diagnosed early, which again, I've talked about this before, if they are diagnosed at age or before age six, and if they are placed in a stable, loving environment, uh, whether that's with the birth parents, hopefully, and if not, if that's not possible, then with an adopt or a foster parent, and if there is absence of violence at home, then things are looking so much better for how they're going to do in the future. But then the part that we're focusing on today is that if they have involvement within the school, a positive school environment with accommodations, as well as special education services and good social services with a good parent advocacy, then their experience is much more better. And these become a huge protective factor uh, to mitigate all the secondary disabilities. So um, I'd like to kind of stop here uh, before I move on to my next segment um, to get some questions maybe about the introduction that I have made. Dr. Ergen, um, the only question we had, I answered it on there so far, and I'll, I'll just read it to you so you know what the question is. Um, this question came from Lola Lewis. She says, I, am, I have a grandson who is 13 years old and he was diagnosed with FASD. I'm interested in knowing if I can get the link to the previous webinar. I would like 
to know more so I can help him to get the services he truly needs. He is on an IEP for his ADHD. So I just gave her the number, the link to our uh, Ohio Moss FASD page. And uh, the first two of those, the first two of um, our series is on the Ohio Moss FASD page. We are working on getting the third one formatted and then we'll download it to that. And of course the fourth and fifth one will be on there as soon as possible. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you for our audience for sharing that and sharing your lived experience. Um, hopefully those uh, webinars will give you the basic understanding for FASD. And then hopefully with some of the documents and the uh, handouts that we also shared along with our slides today, there is a wealth of information there for you to kind of like also see is there anything else that you can do within the schools um, as we talk about um, the rest today? We do have one more question. Um, how does one get diagnosed with FASD? I think um, that uh, because again, today's focus is on education and I had a full on webinar on the diagnosis part. Um, maybe that would be for, for our audience, that would be also great to link uh, I think that was my second uh, webinar, right, um, Karen? So mm -hmm. I think that would be a great one to view. And then I have my email address there. And after viewing that, uh, if there are any more specific questions, I'd be happy to answer through the email as well for that part. This next. Is, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Alexis. Do you have any live questions? I do have a hand up, or did you want to? Yeah, definitely. If all the other questions are done, then we can do the hand. It looks like right when I unmuted, one more question came up from the q and I didn't know how you wanted to do the live ones. Yes, um, once the uh, other questions in the chat or Q&A are done, if they are done, Karen, then uh, we could uh, unmute our audience and then I can get the question. Okay. So I have two more questions. Um, my next question is, there are... Are there any specialized programs or entities? What recommendations should ask for in a IEP? Oh, okay. Addie, the next section after I'm done with mine, Addie will talk uh, really long and she has wonderful information on what you should include in the IEP, what should be included in there. She has wonderful information. So to our audience, I'll just say, hang tight. She has excellent information that's coming in, okay? And the last one so far is, are there major differences between ADHD and FASD? Um, again, that's in my um, second webinar too, but I'll do a quick you know, run on on that. There are some differences, definitely. Um, a child with just pure ADHD uh, will show the symptoms later in the years uh, around their school age, uh, but a child with FASD who also has ADHD uh, is going to start the symptoms really, really early on. Children with FASD respond to ADHD medication less favorably, okay, than a child who only has ADHD. And then in terms of their attentional difficulties, there are some difficulties, but what they share is both impulsivity, hyperactivity, and executive functioning difficulties. But for our children with FASD, the executive functioning difficulties are much more pronounced and much more deep than a child with only ADHD. So those are some of the ones, but I have um, two slides on that webinar, and I also talked over those much more in detail. So if you get a chance to view my second webinar on um, diagnosis, where I also went through, I think, some of the um, uh, comorbidities, um, or the first one, I'll have to remember that, then um, those detail a lot of those differences there too. And if there are no more, then we can do on our, our uh, audience with it who wants to raise their hands. It looks like there are no other written ones. I do have a hand up from a Dominique Johnson. Yeah. I'm not Hi. sure I can unmute her. I'm not sure if. Hi, um, I had a question regarding the FASD and the ADH diagnosis. Do you guys see um, kind of the individuals and youth that seem to be diagnosed with ADHD, but usually have AA, excuse me, FASD. 
Yes, hi Dominic. Thank you so uh, much for your question. Um, yeah, that's a great question um, on that topic. So um, let me first start out with the statistics uh, for you. Um, 70, up to 70 to almost 80% of our children with FASD also get diagnosed with ADHD. So there is such a big overlap. And you might say, why? Well, the reason is that alcohol disrupts the same brain area where ADHD uh, you know, brain functions are also impacted. For ADHD, it's genetic. For FASD, it's due to the alcohol. It's the frontal lobe and it's that specific area. That's why we see such a big overlap, okay? But then what happens is that although they can be diagnosed together, most of the time <clears throat> our students with FASD get diagnosed with ADHD, but they don't get diagnosed with the FASD. So what's happening here is that we are missing the FASD. We are only seeing the ADHD. And what's wrong with that? Lots of things. So that means that we are just treating after with just the ADHD part, but we're leaving out all the struggles that come as a result of FASD. And up to, again, 70 to 80% of our children with FASD gets this missed. The diagnosis gets missed and everyone focuses on ADHD. But this is not a typical child with ADHD. So you are definitely right on that. Yes. Thank you so much. I just wanted to get some clarification on that because um, this is my first training um, identifying with the fetal alcohol syndrome. So I wanted to, you know, get some clarification on it because it seems like the similarities are, you know, so much the same with ADHD exactly. that a lot of youth are getting mixed diagnosed when it may be the fetal alcohol syndrome that they need to address versus the ADHD right away. Definitely. Well, first of all, thanks for hopping on and uh, being on here and uh, trying to increase your, you know, knowledge and literacy in this area. We're so happy to have you. And um, as I said, I think in my first uh, webinar, if you could um, find that link, um, I do a lot on that differentiation and then the primary symptoms. So hopefully that will add on to that knowledge for you. Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other hands? I don't see any, so. Okay. All right, and then I'll do another. I, I see a hand. Is that the oh. hand that, should I have hit that hand? Um, I had a hand up. I'm I'm just trying to see if was that that was from Dominique Johnson. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. I'll do another. We'll do another stop. We always will stop and ask, you know, get some more questions and also trying to make sure we can get all the good information in for you as well today. So the next segment, um, thank you, Alexis and Karen, for addressing the questions. Um, the next part is how schools accommodate students with FASD. Now that we have learned about or uh, the what a student with FASD looks like in the school environment, then let's turn our attention to what are we doing in the schools to address these problems. Okay? So um, they did a survey in 2016 to look uh, and gather information from the parents of students and adult individuals on the FASD spectrum and the professionals on their experience regarding special education laws. Okay. So um, what they found was that 90% of the caregivers said that their child had some kind of an IEP. And for those of you who are in the educational field or, or have a child with FASD or other um, disorders, you know that IEP is an individualized education plan that's put together. Uh, and that is kind of like that formal contract of what your child will, what kind of special education services your child will get within the schools. However, 60% said that the concerns that their child with FASD had was not uh, addressed in that IEP. So going back to um, Dominic's point as to maybe 40% uh, would address through an IEP with ADHD because it was only focusing on ADHD, but then 60% was not addressed because the IEP was not focusing on the FASD part because that was missed probably. And then 60% indicated that their child was being served under other disability categories and not, on, not under other health impairments. So I want you to get your attention to this. Um, at schools, we have educational categories like autism, intellectual disability, other health problems, uh, and then traumatic brain injury and so forth. So when a child gets a diagnosis, the school decides 
which of these categories they fit. And then they decide under which category can the child receive special education interventions, okay? So for FASD right now, we do not have a specific category. They tried that, but for the last one, it was kind of like refused. So we hope for the next iteration of the IDEA, which is our special education law. So we do not have a specific category for FASD. We have a specific category for intellectual disability. We have one for autism. Well, uh, but we do not have one for FASD. And then where, how can we get our children um, categorized or just accepted in terms of that getting those special education services? They can be qualified under what we call OHI, which is the other health impairment category, okay? However, the other health impairment category has lots of examples underneath that under the law. One of them is ADHD. So that's why we can say for sure ADHD goes in there. We have Tourette syndrome. They also tried to add FASD as an example. They did not accept that yet. So that's where we are lacking at this point because if the schools don't have that as even as an example of a medical condition that could be under OHI, then there is less chances that the school will be, uh, the schools will be um, amenable to giving these services, okay? And then only almost 8% of the parents felt that the category that used to qualify their children was relevant. Because let's say, let's think about this student. The student has no cognitive impairments, it's normal IQ. So then they will not be categorized under ID. Let's say it's the 30% of that kid and that doesn't have ADHD. They will not be qualified under ADHD. Maybe they'll qualify under specific learning disabilities because of their learning issues, but the SLD category will only address the learning issues. What about the behavioral part of FASD? So that's not going to be captured. So a lot of the times families find themselves really frustrated within the educational system, not knowing which way to go. And um, they just said that FASD is not recognized under the IDA. It creates a lot of big barriers. So that's something that, um, you know, as advocates, professionals and so forth that we need to definitely advocate. So um, schools um, at this point do not have enough information regarding what FASD is. And uh, families can get frustrated, concerned um, to see whether their children will get an appropriate education. Um, and then the families usually find themselves concerned that schools do not understand what the symptoms are. All the things I explained to you today and more what those symptoms are. And as a result of that, all they see is a child who has behavioral issues, who is not understanding really well and is struggling academically, uh, who could be destructive and violent. And as a result of that, all they focus on is disciplining the child and not doing any of those accommodations that Addie will talk about today. So adverse school experiences will make the life, as I said, of a child with FASD much worse and then will lead to some of the secondary disabilities I talked about. So um, the lack of, there's also lack of teacher and school knowledge, like knowledge based on FASD. So uh, they did a study in 2019 and what they found was that the teachers and other school staff did not have sufficient knowledge. Again, this is no way to say that they're to be blamed. It's just how the system is working right now. And they didn't understand how diverse and variable the presentation of a child with FASD is, which goes back to what I talked to you about today at the very beginning. And this lack of knowledge affected how they perceived their children with FASD and how they were able to support them. Because they had limited understanding, it led them to misinterpret the children's behavior as maybe being mischievous, as being a bad child, as a child who's just non-compliant. And therefore, they only focused on that part and not some of the other uh, difficulties that arise as a result of the um, impairments that they have. Um, what they also saw was that there is a lack of systematic training and preparation for teachers at the pre-service, at the in-service level. I cannot tell you how many times that I couldn't really, although I offered my services for free for some schools, I said, I'd like to come and talk to you about FASD for an in-service. And then the school said, well, our time is, we already are full. We're talking about other things. And 
anytime I wanted to talk about suicide prevention or autism, they invited me. But then when it was about FASD, I never got any, you know, a lot of invites for that. So that speaks to the level that where we're not really considering this as an issue you know, within the schools at this point. Therefore, there is lack of information that's out there. And we also need to have greater collaboration between the school and the parents and the guardians, which um, Addie will talk about more in the area of advocacy. So the type of school interventions that we can have is, uh, and I'll start talking about each. The first one is, let's say your child has a diagnosis, you have the report, and then um, what, do you, what do we do first? Well, first uh, we can go and ask for basic intervention services. This is called response to intervention, tier one, tier two services. So this is saying um, they, they will not receive yet special education services, but they will receive some help at the general education where with all the other children. So the school determines what kind of help that is, um, which could be like giving an aid, uh, working with an intervention specialist to do some extra work at school. This is called the first step of help. Um, this could have some kind of a written plan, but it's not mandated by law. So. I, I've seen a lot of uh, families getting stuck at this level because the schools are refusing or do not want to provide more in-depth services. So if you are stuck at that level, you know that you have uh, more opportunities to move forward, okay? Um, so then what else is out there for school? The next thing that I'd like to talk about is what we call Section 544 plan. So Section 544 plan um, is uh, when a student, um, can get services within the school if they have a physical or mental impairment. And this mental or physical impairment limits major life capabilities or school capabilities, okay? So um, this is less stringent than the IEP process or special education services. So if the child qualifies under Section 504, what they receive is only accommodations. Accommodations are certain things uh, that are employed or implemented by the school to circumvent the disability and highlight their strengths in making sure that they, they will be successful at school. What are some of the examples? Accommodations are things like, um, for example, if they can be seated up front because they're too distracted, right? If they can get the notes of the teacher instead of listening because they may have a hard time processing, okay? They might get an aid to keep them on task when they move from one activity to another. So these are all called accommodations. Accommodations are wonderful. However, they may not be just helpful as much uh, to the point of they are not to teach in a different way. So accommodations don't teach. They just provide the right environment for the child or the student to flourish. So that's a great first step to start out with and maybe a lot of your, you know, you out there as parents might have started out with a Section 504 and getting those accommodations in place, which is really, really important. And then Addie will talk about what those look like. Um, and then the next step, if accommodations are not adequate, then we can go on to what we call um, special education interventions under IDEA. IDEA is the federal uh, legislation that provides federal funding to the schools where a student is qualified um, and um, eligible under a disability category that the school determines, then they can get free and appropriate education in the least restrictive environment. There are 13 disability categories that I formally mentioned to. And then as I said, FAST could fit into other health impairment category, OHI category. Uh, or it could also fit into ID if the child also has intellectual disability. Or it can be in the category of um, specific learning disabilities if the child has learning disabilities. So if the child is qualified, then they can get what we call individual education plan or individualized education plan and IEP. IEP is a formal document that's mandated by law and that's created by the school that outlines all the steps that will be taken. How will this child be educated? Now here, that's when we have inter interventions. So now not accommodations, but interventions are things, how are we going to teach this child differently than others so that they can actually learn better? So interventions are really, really helpful. How can we prevent 
the behavioral meltdowns. So that's an intervention, not an accommodation. So IEP, therefore, is going to be the, probably the most helpful for your child with FASD, especially if they are having more severe symptoms. The school will put together what we call evaluation team report. So you could be coming from outside with your independent report to school, and then the school still has to conduct their own evaluation and integrate the results of your report to their own evaluation. Okay, and that evaluation will be called ETR, which is the evaluation team report. After the ETR is put together, the school team, along with the parent, will sit down and they will come up with an IEP plan for your child to receive what we call special education interventions. Um, so the teacher can start the referral process or any of you parents can start that process by giving a letter to school saying, I would like my child to be evaluated. Um, and the school must respond within 30 days. They could say like, nope, we don't want to evaluate and provide these services. You're good with your accommodations or with your you know, initial uh, general education interventions, or they may agree to evaluate the child. If they agree to evaluate, they need to complete the testing in 60 days, and they need to hold an IEP meeting within the 30 days after the last day of um, testing at the school. IEPs need to be put together and children need to be re-evaluated every three years, but annually IEPs need to be revised. And Addy will talk about what should be in, in those IEPs. And then the last piece for my section, I'd like to mention that IDEA, Section 504, IEPs, all of those um, are free to any child that's documented to have a disability. And if the school, you know, of course, accepts all that process. Uh, only within the public schools. So private schools, uh, because they do not receive federal funding, they are not mandated to provide special education services to children, to any child. And that of course includes our children with FASD. So if your child is attending a private school and if your child needs special education services, I've had that conversation with the families indicating that um, they have options to transfer to public school, you know, homeschooling and different types of things, but and then there are some really good private schools that would contract with some psychologists to provide these services or with some um, you know, specialists to provide some of these services um, to children. However, they are not mandated to do so. So that's also a piece of information I think that the, uh, especially parents should have when they try to decide which school their children, they want their children to go or to transition um, after they get the diagnosis. So I will stop here because uh, this is the time that we break for Addie's section and I'll get her situated. Uh, but while doing that, I'll probably maybe see if there are any other questions that I can address regarding the part, the last segment that I talked about. Let me take a look real quick. Um... I don't have any. This is Alexis. Is there a reason that the schools do not acknowledge FASD? Is it because it is a preventable condition? That's a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, thank you for that. So uh, that's something that I've been thinking about. And some of the things that I've read in the literature so far um, point out to this. Um, yes, you are right, because uh, it could be a you know, preventable condition that um, a lot of the, the mothers and a lot of the families who experience FASD do um, experience what we call public stigma. And that's the, my next topic that I'll be talking about in my next webinar in more detail. So what that means is that everyone, all the stakeholders, schools, professionals, media, us, everyone, everyone involved um, do show some kind of stigma towards individuals with FASD, towards uh, biological mothers who drank during pregnancy. And there is a lot of that blame that kind of like goes into this, um, like, okay, if you didn't drink, this wouldn't have happened. So because of that public stigma that's out there, and we're at this point really not doing a whole lot to address that public stigma, then um, everybody thinks that FASD is so rare, it doesn't affect a whole lot of children or families. 
And they think that because it's preventable, then this is not something that they should spend their, you know, public dollars or funds or initiatives on, or that they should really, you know, care about. Um, however, that's not true. It's two to five percent more prevalent than autism, and it impacts a lot of uh, children, adults, and families and professionals. It impacts uh, everyone that's kind of like involved. So I think more education more contact with individuals who have had lived experiences um, is very, very helpful. And for like all of you attending webinars like this, the more we learn and the more we increase our health literacy regarding FASD, I think we will all find in ourselves ways to uh, be more engaged and engage in more of those prevention, but also engage more in these in-services where schools start to realize that actually some of the children that they are having difficulties with might have an FASD instead of the ADHD or other diagnosis. Okay. Um, Marcy, I don't really understand your next question. You said, it looks like it says, sorry, it does not always work. If you raised your hand, you could be more clear about, we can unmute you and you could be more clear about what, what it is you're asking. Do you want to do that? We don't know what you mean about sorry, it does not work, always work. We can come back to that, Dr. Irving. Mm -hmm. or, or they could put it in the chat too. Afterwards, I'm happy to address those too later okay. on. She said she was, um, it looks like she did another chat. She was apologizing for the spelling. Oh, for the spelling. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Mm -hmm. I know it's it's so hard to just uh, write and just check all the, all the time. And um, we just want to put our questions in there. Don't worry about spelling. That's what I say to my students too. I said, don't worry about spelling. Just put your wonderful questions out there, so. All right, any other questions I can address? I don't have any. Doesn't look like any. Okay, all right. Well, then um, I'm very excited and proud to uh, then um, leave the platform um, to my doctoral student, Addie, to talk about uh, an area that she's actually completing her dissertation on. So she's the pro and the expert on this. Uh, the rest of this part. So. Uh, please go ahead, Eddie, and then I will forward your slides. Thanks, Dr. Aragoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Thank you. Okay, good. So, and sorry again about my camera. Um, it's still not working, so I'm going to have to go on with just the audio. I guess this is one of the downfalls of doing a virtual presentation, but we'll have to work with what we have. Um, so thank you again for providing us with that extensive overview of the difficulties that these students face in the classroom. And now kind of what one of our audience members already had a question about, we're gonna get into some of the effective educational practices that promote um, these students' um, educational success, okay? Um, and so like Dr. Ergun mentioned, there are these services come in the form of accommodations as well as special education interventions. So I wanted to start first with talking about the accommodations um, because like she mentioned, not all of these students for a number of different factors will be on an IEP um, and receiving special education services. So it's really important for both teachers, other school prof professionals, as well as parents to be aware of these accommodations. Um, and as I'll talk about mention, and as I'll talk about later in the advocacy section of this presentation, there are many members of the child's educational team, and we all need to be informed of the services and accommodations that are out there for these students um, to have an increased likely that they are going to get the different accommodations and interventions that they need. Um, and as Dr. Ergun mentioned, due to the wide range of intellectual and behavioral abilities of these students, they're also placed in a variety of educational settings. So whereas some with more difficulties may be placed in specifically special education classrooms with a smaller number of students and special with special education teacher, 
teachers. Um, often other students will be placed in the regular classroom setting. Um, so it's important for not only special education teachers, but as well as general education teachers to be aware of these accommodations and interventions because they are likely to have these students in their classroom. Next. Next. Okay, um, so I first wanna talk about just setting the stage for these students with a successful classroom environment, whether that be in the general classroom setting or a special education setting. Um, and so what teachers really need to um, recognize and pay attention to is providing a sense of calmness, order, and organization for these students. Um, and specifically a calm environment is going to provide a sense of security for these students. Um, because as Dr. Ergen mentioned, they do have some of those social and emotional difficulties. Um, so if they feel more safe, they are gonna be better able to learn in their environment. Um, it's also important to um, minimize auditory, auditory and visual distractions, um, which I'll talk about later, a couple strategies to address these um, things to minimize those distractions. Um, and we also wanna make sure that the classroom is well organized and highly structured. Um, because this can decrease confusion and frustration that these students often have when they are having difficulties understanding a math problem or engaging in some of those other um, academic activities that Dr. Ergun already mentioned. Um, and then it can also maximize their ability to focus on the classroom task at hand instead of being distracted by some of the other things going on in their environment. Um, and so what we also know is that small classroom is the environment that works best for most of these students. However, it's important to recognize that a small classroom setting isn't always available because as I mentioned, not all of these students will be placed in those smaller setting classrooms. Um, so what teachers can do in those larger classroom settings is to provide small workstations. And it's really important to provide a positive name for these stations. So to try to make the student feel like they're not being excluded or called out. Um, so maybe calling it something like the office or the workstation, not being completely secluded from the entire classroom, but again, just creating a smaller um, immediate environment for that student can be very helpful. Next. So what are some classroom environment strategies that teachers can implement, whether they're in the general classroom or a special education classroom that's gonna be important for these students' success? So the first thing that teachers are gonna to wanna to do is define and organize the classroom space. Um, this could be in the form of strategically placing the student's desk away from distractions. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, um, they could create a quiet, corner or office workspace for these students to complete their individual work at, um, as well as maybe using photos, pictures, or words to label storage shelves and define where items belong. So it's very easy and accessible for these students to know where their different classroom materials are. Another thing that teachers are going to want to do is to make sure that the classroom is tidy and neat to decrease, um, again, decrease distractions that um, could be caused, um, cause the students to um, be distracted from their work. Um, so again, using cabinet and storage boxes um, to put away their supplies that they aren't using, you know, so they don't have a ton of materials out on their desk and can easily be distracted by the scissors when they're, you know, supposed to be doing a more written assignment, things of that sort keeping them away and tucked into places where they can be easily accessible if they do need them, but away and kind of out of sight when they don't need them out for whatever activity they're um, doing at the time. Um, another strategy for this is to cover bookshelves with a cloth or blanket when they're not being used, again, to just make it a little bit more out of sight, out of mind for these students can be really helpful. Um, and also use use in and out baskets for classwork and homework. Again, you know, when kids are in class, they have a lot of sheets, they have a lot of different assignments. So having particular baskets for homework, a particular basket for school assignments um, can really help um, minimize those distractions for them. Along with some, some of those distractions is keeping visual distractions to a minimum. 
um, because some of the, um, due to some of the sensory issues that these students may have, they again can get really distracted by really bright lights or loud noises or even bright colored things in the classroom. And I know teachers are really, really good at providing those really bright, colorful diagrams and pictures to represent the days of the week and, you know, the different, um, you know, um, you know, other things in the classroom that they might have. Um, but again, for these students, it can really serve as distractions. So maybe just eliminating some of the more hanging diagrams and mobiles um, that you might have in the classroom that could serve as distractions. Um, another thing to think about is maybe decorating in more quiet or calmer colors, um, whether that be more paler blues and pinks and yellows. So still incorporating, you know, the colors that we think of when we think of a classroom, you know, environment, but making them not as bright, um, because again, that could cause some sensory issues for these kiddos. Um, and then we also, like I mentioned on the last slide, um, is we want to provide a quiet, calm in environment as best as we can. Now, again, when you're in that larger general classroom setting, it can be really hard to do this, right? When you have 25 other kids running around um, and you can't control, you know, the uh, loudness of their voices and things of that sort. Um, but what we do know is we can control what we can try to control for, right? So setting the stage for this could be something simple as keeping the lighting more subtle um, and the noise level low to a point that you can control. Um, and then another good strategy for this is even having headphones um, available for these students for quiet time, or if they do, um, you can sense that they are maybe agitated or getting distracted by some of the loud noises. Again, just to help provide that quiet, calm environment. Next slide. Okay, so now that we have talked about um, some strategies for the specific classroom environment, now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about effective teaching strategies um, to use with these kiddos that help address some of the difficulties that Dr. Ergun mentioned before. Um, and as I mentioned previously, um, it, it's not just important for teachers to know this, but also for parents. And I'll kind of talk about that more in the advocacy section so that you understand what are the effective strategies that teachers should be and can be using that are out there to help with these students and then you'll be better able to advocate for their needs if you can provide some examples and show that you're already knowledgeable on okay here are some things that might help you address this difficulty that they're having in the classroom so the first one is to provide a structured environment because as Dr. Ergen had talked about, they have very um, difficult time with cognitive flexibility and some of those impulse control and things of that sort. So providing a structured environment can help set the stage to kind of decrease some of those behaviors at the get go. Um, and this can be in the form of, you know, most classrooms have classroom rules, right? So maybe having a few simple rules that are very concrete written on the board or even on the student's desk, like laminated for them to, you know, be able to see on the board and also see right in front of them. So it's very structured. They know exactly what they are and how they should follow them. You can even use picture cues to help go along with the words. Um, and another um, strategy that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes is using variety to explain certain things, whether that be visually, tactilely, auditorily. So just having a variety of ways to present information and rules and tasks to these students can also be really helpful. Um, another thing to, um, that kind of falls under the structured environment is simplifying the students' notebooks and belongings. So like I mentioned previously, you know, there's so many papers and subjects that these students have, but maybe just having one big three ring binder instead of five different individual ones for each subject can be really helpful for these kids. And then within the notebook, you have a color coded dividers for each subject. And then another thing that can be really helpful because a lot of times these kids um, may be more forgetful. So they might have a book at home or a book at school that they forgot when they went home. But if you have two sets of books, one at home and one at school, then it won't matter if they forget it because there already will be a second set there. Um, so just kind of thinking outside the box a little bit um, to, for ways that we can help these students and promote a successful learning experience for them. 
Um, and going along with that, keeping open communication, communication between the home and the school, which I'll get into a little bit more in depth later. Um, so even providing like a daily homework sheet and a notebook that requires a parent signature so that the teacher and the parent are on the same page. Um, and it's very clear to the parent, okay, this is what the homework is. I'm going to sign off on it. And then when the student takes it back to the classroom, the teacher, you know, can see very clearly, okay, this, the parent signed off on it or they didn't. Um, and it can increase communication in that regard. Um, the second effective strategy is a consistent routine. Um, and again, with doc, what Dr. Ergen said about these students having a harder time with transitions, it's really, really important to keep a consistent classroom routine. So what does this look like? Um, it can look like a, having assigned seats for the kids, right? So they come in, they know exactly where they are supposed to sit when they get into the classroom. It's not this open, um, you know, some teachers and classrooms, oh, you can sit wherever you want to. Um, but for these kids, having an assigned seat can be very helpful. Posting and reviewing a daily schedule, kind of going along with those classroom rules. You could have the classroom rules up and then right next to it, have a list of the daily schedule, okay? It, 9 a.m. we do reading, at 10 a.m. we take a break and have snacks. So very consistent step-by-step um, -step routine um, can be helpful. Um, again, you also wanna assist students with transitions because these can be very difficult and cre can create some of those emotional meltdowns that we sometimes see in the classroom from these students or even some behavioral outbursts. Um, so ways that teachers can do this is prepare them ahead of time for transitions and changes in the schedule such as if there's gonna be a substitute teacher because they're gonna be out for a couple of days, or if there's an upcoming school vacation or holiday and that's gonna change the schedule. Um, it can be really helpful to let them know in advance so that they can mentally prepare um, and it not be this like quick and sudden change that they weren't expecting. Um, another strategy for this can be the teacher and the student collaboratively coming up with a signal for a transition. So whether that be a tap on the shoulder, if that's what they want to do, a certain, you know, hand signal, something along those lines to kind of um, communicate to the student, okay, we're going to be getting ready for a transition instead of maybe having to announce it to the whole class, just a subtle way of, okay, we're going to getting ready for a transition um, and it can help them, then help them become more prepared for that when it comes. Um, the third one is keeping presentations brief. Um, so as Dr. Ergun said, these students sometimes have difficulties um, holding that information in their head for a very long time and then manipulating it and having to do something with it. So if we can keep the language that we use simple and break the information into smaller pieces and chunks, giving step-by-step -step instructions one at a time, that can be really helpful. So instead of of you know, telling a student, okay, I need you to go sit down, take out your folder, pull out your notebook, and do this task. You know, giving them one step, having them complete it, watching them complete it, and then giving them the second step so that they don't have to hold all that information in their head. And then also using visuals to represent the steps can be really helpful. Um, the fourth strategy is going to be using variety, um, and this really refers to using a variety of teaching methods and activities these students to help present the information. Um, and this can look like um, look like a lot of different ways, like in the form of a lot of different things, um, and also trying to incorporate multiple senses as possible, so visual, auditory, tactile. Um, what we know is that these students respond really well to activity-based learning. So what that means is hands-on projects um, and also activities that relate learning back to the students' life experiences can be really helpful for them because they may have a harder time generalizing. But if it's about them and they can relate it back to either an experience they've had or their family or someone they know, um, it can help them kind of connect those two pieces together um, more easily. And then also using technology tools, you know, we're in this virtual world right now. Um, so using computer games, videos to explain concepts, different things like that can be very helpful for these students. Um, and then the next strategy, number five, is repetition, um, which I think Dr. Aragoon kind of already talked about too, just in, because they have difficulty with memory, repeating, practicing, repeating again. 
um, is vital for these students. Um, so having multiple activities for one specific concept to reiterate the point can be really, really helpful. Um, again, using a step-by-step -step approach and teaching the steps in the same sequence can help with some of those memory difficulties that these students face. And then a couple other ones that are more related to kind of the style of the teachers um, and parents involved in the students' learning. Um, so we want to be really creative in our approach to learning. And I've kind of already alluded to some of the ways you can be creative in terms of bringing in other sensory activities, ways of learning, ways to um, represent the information that you want to teach the child um, can be really, really helpful, especially when you sense that they might be having difficulty understanding the concept. I mean, it might not be the concept itself, but the way that you're presenting it. So having a creative way, you know, whether that be, okay, I'm speaking this verbally, they're not really getting it. Let's pull out a sheet of paper and try to draw it pictorially and see if they understand it that way better. Or, okay, maybe it's the way I'm presenting it. So let me see if I can find a YouTube video that explains the same concept and, you know, with funner characters and, you know, different types of, you know, simulating things that you might not be able to do as yourself. Um, and then the seventh one is compassion and patience. And, you know, as teachers and parents and advocates and really anyone working with students in these, this environment, we want to be compassionate and patient with all of our students, but it's especially important with these students. Um, even small praise can be really, really helpful for their self-esteem. Um, so we want to make sure that we do praise the small um, positive things that they're doing, not just larger achievements in the classroom. So if that means that they followed your direction and you praise them, go for it, you know? Just those small things can go a long way with these students. And also celebrating small improvement. Small improvement. So if they're struggling on a certain concept related to math or reading, and you know, they might not have gotten 100, but they got, you know, a little bit better than they did before. We want to recognize that and give praise to that um, because it can be really, really important. All right, next slide. Eddie, I think this is where we can break. Um, okay. Right, Karen, um, would you like to announce the break? You can go ahead, Dr. Perkins. Okay, um, so I think uh, we usually uh, do like, because um, we have a lot of information, but a five minute break for snacks and just a uh, natural break. So um, we'll probably do that. I'll look at the time and then within five minutes, then um, we'd like to come back again and um, continue where we left off. Thank you.
All right, I think our five minutes is up. So hopefully everybody uh, is back. So we will just continue um, with Eddie's section to talk about working as a team with parents. Yes, and there are a couple questions in the chat. Dr. Ergun, do you okay. want me to wait or address them now? Um, I think if, if Karen is uh, able to read them, that would be good to address, maybe like a, a good break to do that. Okay, I can read them. Um, the first question is, um, just want to share a model of simple rules that I learned about at the Ohio Early Childhood Conference a couple of years ago. I, list, I listen, I am safe, I am kind. So she just wanted to share that. Any suggestions with support or advocate that can help the parent with discussing these strategies, getting into the IEP? Any suggestions with support or advocacy that can help the parent with discussing these strategies into the IEP? Yes, my whole next section will give a ton of strategies for how to implement um, certain ways to kind of get some of your some of these across in an IEP. So yes, just hold off on that, but it will be coming shortly. And, and I do like the um, what our audience has learned from the other conference and they do speak to how to engage in that self regulation and how to teach self regulation kids and the skills to our uh, you know students with FASD so definitely those would work uh, really wonders as well. And that's it. Okay. And I don't have any hands raised. Alrighty, then I will continue. Um, so it is really essential to establish communication and collaboration between teachers and parents um, for the success of these students. Um, and it's really important for teachers to kind of open the door for communication by building a purposeful relationship with the caregivers at the beginning of the school year. And we really want this relationship to be built on trust and the mutual goal of successful school experiences for the child. Um, and in turn, by building a relationship with the child's family to better understand the needs of these individual students, um, they can create a direct line of communication for both positive and negative occurrences um, in the classroom. So um, I'll get a little bit more into some specific strategies on how to um, strengthen this relationship when I talk about the advocacy piece as well as some co some common problems that often arise in this relationship and ways to address those. But I just wanted to preface with that this is one of the essential pieces of this kind of puzzle when creating a successful school environment for these students. Next. Next, okay. Um, so now I am, oh, sorry, go back one. Okay, so now I'm gonna discuss briefly some of the school-based interventions for students with FASD um, that have been developed over the last few years. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much specific detail on them, but it's a very, very important for both teachers as well as parents to understand that these are out there um, and that most of them address a specific difficulty related to some of the difficulties that Dr. Ergun already discussed, dependent on um, which difficulties are more present for that particular student um, and our interventions that if a school or school district do offer can be implemented into an IEP plan. Um, next. Okay, so the first one is Math Interactive Learning Experience, also known as MILE. Um, it was a program that was specifically developed to address the math skills and behavioral difficulties of students with FASD. Um, in addition to teaching the children certain skills, it also includes methods and manuals for the caregivers, teachers, and tutors um, that provide information specifically specifically on FASD as a disorder, 
um, tips for caregiver advocacy, behavior managers, tips for helping the students with their math skills. Um, it is a six week program, originally designed as a prevention program, but now can also be used as an intervention if there are ongoing difficulties when students start that kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Um, and it can be implemented in a variety of settings, so not only within a school system, but also at clinics and other community settings. And studies have found that this program specifically can improve math skills as well as handwriting skills and behavioral regulation. Next. So the next one is literacy and language training, which would be particularly helpful for students with those expressive and receptive language difficulties that Dr. Ergun mentioned. And as she talked about, not every student with FASD will have these difficulties. But again, it's important to know that there is this program out there if you do have a student that does have some more language difficulties and this is again a classroom-based program designed to teach language skills phonological awareness and other literacy skills to improve academic performance in reading writing and spelling um, it has a lot of literacy components such as phoneme identification and letter knowledge segmentation and blending manipulation of syllables and phenomes as well as reading real words and non-words, spelling and semantic training. Um, this, is, this one is a, um, conducted in a small group format um, and is intended to be led by a speech language therapist. And I'll talk later on about the different members of this child's educational team. But a lot of times there will be a speech and language therapist working with the student, um, pulling them out of the classroom if they are experiencing some of these language difficulties. Um, this program is designed to occur twice a week for 30 minutes over a nine month period. So really for the duration of an entire school year um, and was designed for students nine to 10 years old, although it has been found to be effective for students as young as seven and as old as 13. Um, and what the research shows is that this program can improve language and literacy skills of these students. Next. Um, so the next one is cognitive control therapy. Um, this program is designed to specifically teach cognitive control strategies and self-regulation skills. So again, some of those executive fun functioning difficulties that Dr. Ergun talked about earlier um, and teaches skills related to body position, movement and awareness, attention, and information processing. This is an individualized program, so a student would meet one-on-one -on -one with whoever was leading the therapy for one hour a week for 10 months. So over the span of the entire school year, um, it's designed for eight to nine-year-olds and again, can be implemented, designed to be implemented in the school setting and kind of pulling the child out so that they don't have to go to an additional service after school. So really a school-based intervention for this one. Um, and it can improve adaptive fun functioning and overall behavior of students with FASD in the classroom. Next. The next one is computerized progressive attention training known as CPAT. Um, so this is a computerized game designed to teach students four skills related to some of their attention difficulties. So specifically targets vigilance, sustained and, and selective attention, as well as executive attention. Um, and for this one, it's also an individualized format um, and is um, trained by a coach. Now the coach does not have to be a um, doctorate level psychologist. It can be an aide in the classroom or another teacher with secondary education. Um, and again, this is a smaller intervention, so 30 minute sessions, but more repetition. So you meet four times a week for 16 hours total. So it's going to include 32 sessions over a span of eight weeks. And um, this one also is designed to be implemented in the school setting and can improve working memory, sustained and selective attention, and reading and math fluency as well. Next. Next. 
So the Good Buddies program is really developed to address some of the social deficits that Dr. Ergun had talked about um, and helping to make these students um, process of making friends easier. Um, so what we know is that some of those social difficulties can have a significant negative impact um, on the children's making or keeping friends at school, um, can maybe even lead to being bullied at school or not having, you know, the most adaptive peer social support. So this is a really good one. If any of this, your students or children are experiencing some of those social difficulties. Um, and what's cool about this is that it takes into consideration neurodevelopmental and behavioral needs specific to children with FASD. So it takes into those considerations and teaches them at the um, appropriate level of their abilities. Um, and this also includes a co-occurring parent group along with a child group. So this is not individual. It's really meant to be a social skills group so that the children can learn the skills and then kind of role play and practice them in the group setting before taking them into whether that be the home, after school activities, back into the classroom. And the parent group, which occurs parallel to the child group, is designed to teach parents how to support their children's friendships and social skills. The groups occur one session per week, about an hour to an hour and a half for the course of 12 weeks um, and can be um, used for any child, child age six to 12. Um, the only kind of this one is because that that parent component it's really meant to be implemented in a clinic or community setting um, but can be very helpful for the social skills related to school um, so if you do have a student who has these difficulties it could be important to reach out um, and do a little bit more digging to see if this program is offered in any of the mental health clinics in your local area next And the last one, Parents and Children Together, um, also known as PACT, and I know Dr. Ergun briefly talked about this as it relates to adults in one of her other webinars, um, but there's also a child version of this program, and this is specifically designed to help children cope with some of their self-regulation and other executive functioning difficulties. So students will learn body and emotional awareness, planning skills, emotional labeling, self-monitoring, and self-regulation skills um, that can help with some of the difficulties such as poor impulse control, their lack of motivation, um, their poor working memory, as well as any inattention, inattention issues that they are having. Um, and children can also learn self-esteem development, um, which can also be really helpful in the classroom. Um, and then the parent focus is really on kind of that psychoeducation piece about what it's like to walk through life with a child with FASD. Um, this is also similar to Good Buddies, co-occurring child and parent groups um, led by a licensed mental health specialist. It's also 12 weeks, one session per week, targeting the same age range as Good Buddies, so six to 12. And again, because it has that parallel parent group, it's gonna be implemented in a clinical setting. So either a mental health clinic or another community-based organization. So really important to kind of know this when searching for these groups in your local areas outside of the school because it will not be implemented in the specific um, classroom environment. And this can improve executive functioning skills as well as emotional problem solving. Next. Okay, so because we are currently in this virtual learning world, we thought it would be helpful to also provide some tips um, for both parents who might be teaching their children in a virtual setting if they're doing their online from home, as well as teachers who may be engaging in some online teaching with their students. Um, and so for online learning, it's really important to ask for clear guidelines for what the specific you know, expectations are upfront, what they need to have completed in one day versus one week versus, you know, one quarter. So kind of setting that stage upfront can be really helpful. And also as 
we've seen today, technological issues can occur. So doing some practice runs to see how the program works beforehand can be really helpful to kind of bug out any of those issues um, before trying to log on for class. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, having structure and routines is really, really helpful for these students' growth. Um, so maintaining a consistent daily routine at home can also be helpful. So you can do this by establishing set hours each day that they're gonna engage in the remote learning if it's not provided by the school. Having specific times, again, kind of like the classroom rules laid out for the students so that they can see exactly, okay, I'm gonna be on this for this long and then I can take a break. Um, also incorporating in breaks for snacks, lunch and other free time can be really helpful because we all know sitting in a seat for six hours is pretty much unbearable. Um, so we can only imagine how it can be for, for those kiddos, right? Um, and then also setting up frequent communication with the teachers can be um, really, really helpful just to make sure that the parent understands scheduling and when assignments are due and things of that sort. Another really, really important one, especially in the age that we currently are of technology is supervision of the internet because if kids are completing all of their assignments online, it can be really, really easy for them to get distracted by Google. So we wanna make sure upfront that if there are parent controls on any devices, that those are activated for certain internet browsers and devices, um, whether that be because we want the student to you know, be on task on our one specific site for school, and then also just regulating in terms of appropriate and inappropriate sites that we might not want the students to have access to. Um, and then also another really important piece is monitoring the unstructured online social exchanges with peers. So I know a lot of times online learning, there might be chat functions so that you can talk with other students or ask questions, but just making sure that all of that discussion and conversation is appropriate um, and not getting too out of hand, um, whether that be because a parent is monitoring or the teacher monitoring either or, or both um, can kind of help prevent any issues that may occur from that. Um, and then in terms of instruction, as I previously mentioned, rep repetition is key for these students. So if the teacher isn't already recording the sessions, it'll be really important for parents to reach out to ask that the sessions can be recorded so that the students can go back later if they haven't processed it all the way and access it for certain activities and homework assignments that they might have if they didn't jot everything down. Um, also, again, if they aren't learning from the particular style of online learning, asking for alternate tasks or alternate ways to get the information or teach the information can be really helpful, as well as monitoring assignment expectations from the teachers um, and kind of gauging as the parent, okay, does this seem like this work, the student can handle this amount of work, or do we need to try to spread it out over a longer period of time? Um, things like that um, can also be useful when parents are kind of in charge of that online learning. Um, in terms of responses, um, we wanna vary, if we can, the types of responses for assignments or tests. Um, so if the student is struggling, kind of creating back that assignment verbally, um, being able to use um, create videos or use the technology since we are online to convey what they've learned um, can be helpful in some situations. And then if the student is not responding at all to the online platform, seeing if there can be the option to print out or request paper activities um, for times when the online is not supporting their learning. And then in regards to the specific activities that are being done with them, developing checklists to break tasks into manageable, piece, manageable pieces can be really helpful um, because I know each school works differently in terms of their online, but a lot of times it can be where they give 25 assignments for the day and they just have to you know, kind of complete them on their own, um, which can be very, very overwhelming you know, for someone like me who's in graduate school, let alone a child with FASD. So helping them develop a checklist to break that into small, more reasonable, manageable steps and goals throughout the day um, can aid in their success for learning online. Next.
And so this slide is really kind of looking at that team approach, as I mentioned. So it's not just the teachers and the parents that are on this child's educational team. Um, there's going to be they're, they could be working with a school psychologist, a resource specialist, a speech and language specialist, an occupational therapist, if they have some of those finer, fine motor or gross motor difficulties, as well as advocates. Um, so it's, an, or it's important to recognize that there are different strategies that these professionals can use. Um, due to the sake of time, though, I'm probably going to keep going um, so I can get to my advocacy piece, but there are some specific strategies outlined in our resource handbook for each one of these other school professionals, if you'd like more information on that. Next. And then again, this is also outlining some of the resources that we provided in the homework or the homework in the resource page for you all, um, specifically for teachers and schools. So the top one, um, the fetal alcohol spectrum disorders educational strategies goes like step by step for each specific difficulty a student with FASD may have and then giving providing specific strategies for teachers. Um, along with the second one, it's kind of the same thing. It's a comprehensive guide for teachers working with these students. And then the bottom two kind of really talk about the team approach. So what does each school professional, whether that be a teacher, an aide, a school psychologist, what are their roles in helping define a successful school experience for these students and specific strategies for each different person on the team. And then the last one is a great, awesome resource. It literally has books, apps, websites for students, teachers, other school professionals, as well as parents. Um, it was designed by the National Organization for Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders, um, a very, very com comprehensive resource um, that can be accessed for free online. And all of these can be accessed for free. If you type them into the name into Google, you will be able to access that for free. And they're also outlined in our resource page. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into my favorite part of this presentation, the special education advocacy piece, um, which I know a lot of you have had questions about in the chat in terms of how do you advocate for your children when, you, when they do have an FASD um, in terms of advocacy. So I'm gonna get right into this. Eddie, um, I think it's a good break to maybe take some questions. I see that there are okay. maybe some out there. Okay. Hey Alexis, can you go to the question box? I lost the question box. I'm unable to find it. Can you get those questions for me, please? I think they're, I see them. They're all, I think, audio. Okay. I lost sound. Is it just me? And then another person, I'm having audio issues. I'm going to log out and then log back in. And then the next, I was able to resolve it without logging out. Okay, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Does anybody have any live questions? Or do we have any hands? I got the hand, let me see. Um, if I can see who that is. Um, Tara, let me see if I can unmute her. She might already ask this question. Um, is she unmuted? I'm not hearing anybody ask. It, it says she is self muted. Oh. <laughs> so we'll we'll go we'll go back to that. Okay, and if maybe there is a question, they can type in, uh, and then we could try to address it in the next stop when we stop the pause for questions. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, Patty, you can go on. Okay, next. Okay, so what is special education advocacy? So we kind of have three different pieces to special education advocacy, or two, so the special education piece and the advocacy advocacy piece. And to really understand 
what special education advocacy is, we need to break down and understand what special education special education is specifically designed um, instruction at no cost to the parent to meet the unique needs of a child with disabilities. So I want you guys to keep that in mind um, as we kind of go through this um, and then see how it relates to our final definition of special education advocacy. So what is an advocate? So an advocate can be any, anyone can really be an advocate for another person, right? Um, and the dictionary defines advocacy as to speak, plead, or argue in favor of, one that argues for a cause, a supporter or defender, one that pleads on another person's behalf. So adv advocates perform several functions. They support, help, assist, and aid. They also speak and plead on behalf of others that they're advocating for. And they defend and argue for people or specific causes. So then taken together, what is a special education advocate? So special education advocates support defend and speak for children with disabilities in order to obtain the appropriate special education services for these children. And there are a couple different types of special education advocates, which I will talk about in a couple slides. Um, but as Dr. Ergen mentioned, parents can serve as advocates for children, specifically children with FASD, um, because parents are really the experts of their children. They are the people that spend the most time with their children um, and really know kind of their child's strengths and weaknesses, um, and then therefore can advocate um, the best on their behalf. Next. So Dr. Ergun already went over this, but I just wanted to do a quick review um, on the special education process. So their first will be a referral submitted by either a parent or a teacher. And then from there, it'll be determined whether there will be testing or evaluation for the disability in an IEP or there won't be. So as she, as she, meant it, as she mentioned, not everybody, not every referral will then lead to testing, but the next step would be testing or evaluation to then determine if the child is eligible for either a 504 plan or an individualized education plan, which is also known as the IEP. And then if an IEP is determined to be the best um, service for the child, then there will be reevaluations that will be completed every three years. Um, and then in IEP meetings, um, there'll be a number of different members involved, right? So you'll have the regular education teacher, special education teachers, other school representatives, and then under the IDA, parents have the right to also attend these IEP meetings, which also kind of provides that avenue to be an advocate for your child in this situation. And we'll get a little bit more into those specific roles in a couple slides. Um, next. So what do special education advocates in general do? Um, what are the specific skills they need to properly advocate for their students? Um, so the first thing that advocates do is gather information, a ton of information, right? So first they need to gather information about the child's disability, about the child's educational history, information on special education advocacy, specifically the special education laws and procedures, um, as well as um, then what they're going to do is use these facts and documents to resolve any disagreements or disputes with the school, as well as advocate for their students in their evaluations and IEP meetings. It's also important for special education advocates to quote unquote, learn the rules of the game. So in order to be an advocate, you really wanna take the time to educate yourself about the local school district, know how decisions are made and by whom, know what your legal rights are, whether that be you know, your parent, your rights as a parent under the IDA, or if you're a different type of special education advocate, what your rights are legally. Um, know what the, ch the child with a disability is entitled to. So specifically a, an appropriate education is what is outlined in the IDA, not the best education. So it's really important to remember that there's a difference between appropriate and best education. 
Um, and then also know the procedures that they must follow in order to protect their rights and, their and the child that they're advocating for's rights. The next thing that they're gonna wanna know how to do is plan and prepare, specifically plan and prepare for those IEP meetings. And I know we already had someone who wanted to know what those specific steps were. So we'll go through what are the steps to develop an IEP? How do we then monitor the child's progress on the IEP? So when we have those re-evaluations, we can determine, okay, are they making progress? Are they regressing? Are they staying the same? Do we think that their disability may fall under a different category? Did we get that wrong the first time? All those different things. But in order to do that, we wanna plan and prepare ahead and have the skills and knowledge to best advocate for these children throughout this process. We also wanna keep written records, right? Because documents are often the key to success and advocacy. So we wanna make records of when we communicate with the school, whether that be the teachers, the special education teachers, have logs, have written letters to the school when we want to be um, tested for special education services, which is automatically included, but then also even writing a letter after an IEP meeting to document what was said so that it's written down so that if you do have a dispute that you may not be um, able to resolve informally and you have to take it to the next level of mediation or due process that it's all documented and there is facts for that proceeding, which we'll get a little bit more into. Um, they also don't wanna be afraid to ask questions, right? So we don't know what we don't know. And I know a lot of times people say this, but no question is a dumb question, especially in this process, because there's so much information that you need to know. So if you don't feel like you understand something or you don't have the full information, it's important to continue to ask those questions, try to get the information from a different source. If you don't feel like the source that you're originally going to is providing you with the most accurate or helpful information and to keep asking questions and get that information. And then we also wanna to listen to answers, right? Because this is a team process. So when you go into those IEP meetings, it's not just you, the parent and the teacher, there's the superintendent, there's the principal, there's the special education, um, teachers and everyone's going to have a different perspective and it's really about having a collaborative process and really listening to the other people's side and coming to an agreement together. Um, and then another thing that advocates do is identify problems. So they learn to define and describe the problems from all angles, right? So use knowledge of interests, um, fears, and positions to develop strategies and parents really well, advocates really are the problem solvers. So they're kind of going in and if there is a problem between, you know, what the parent thinks should be, you know, happening in terms of services, what the teacher thinks should be happening, what the superintendent thinks should be happening, they're really there to kind of look at all angles and then come up with a solution that everybody can agree upon. And then the final thing is to propose the solutions, right? So after kind of gathering all the information, getting all the facts, learning all the different perceptions from all the different people on this child's educational team, proposing sol solutions that are feasible and meet all the child's educational needs. Next. So there are different types of special education advocates. This presentation focuses on parents as advocates, but I did wanna talk about the other types just so that people are aware that they are out there and what their specific roles can be. Um, so the first one is lay advocates, and these advocates are normally there to help parents resolve problems within the school. Um, if it does have to get to the point of mediation or due process hearings. So these advocates are most knowledgeable about legal rights and responsibilities and can be a really good resource for parents if it does come to that point or if they, the parent doesn't feel like they are as knowledgeable on the specific legal rights and aspects of this process. The second type of advocate is an educational advocate and what these advocates primarily do is evaluate 
children and make recommendations about specific educational services. So again, this is another resource if a parent doesn't think that they are most knowledgeable or up to date on the services or accommodations or interventions out there that could best help their child. Um, they can get in contact with an educational advocate who can be more helpful in that area. And then school personnel are kind of advocates in and of themselves, right? They're there to provide support for children and families as a part of their job. Um, but what can become a little tricky is kind of having a dual role in the fact that, you know, teachers are kind of on the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to school bureaucracies. So there might be, you know, they only have so much power to advocate because that's kind of where their role. So not go stepping outside of their role. So what we know is that parents can be really great advocates for their children, one, because they know the child best, and two, because if they can acquire all this information that lay advocates have about the special education laws, about edu what educational advocates know in terms of the interventions and accommodations out there for um, whatever disability their children, their child might have, then they can kind of bring all of that to the table in addition to their expertise on their child as a whole person. Next. So when parents are serving as advocates, it's really important to first understand what the parents' rights are under the IDA and then what the children's rights are too. So under the IDA, parents have a right to access all educational records. Um, they are, have the right to have an independent evaluation outside of the school if they wish to do so. They have the right to consent to testing and services or to not consent to testing or services offered by the school. They can refuse some or all of the services offered if they wish to do so. Parents also have the right to attend and participate in meetings about the child services, so those IEP meetings. Um, and they also have the right to request mediation or file a complaint if they do not feel like they are getting the appropriate services through the IEP meeting. There's a couple things that parents don't have the right to do so that kind of fall under this that I wanted to briefly mention. So they can't copy testing protocols specifically. Um, the school might charge for copies of records. You have access to the educational records, but you can't copy the specific testing protocols that are done in the evaluations. Um, and schools do have the right to um, have IEP meetings without the parent to update if a parent has not responded to them in terms of, you know, coming to the meeting, then after so many times, the school can go ahead and do the IEP meeting without the IEP meeting without the parent present. So it's really important to make sure that you have all those dates and you are responding if you do want to be a part of the process, because if not, they can go forward without you. And then in terms of the child's rights, so they have the right to learn in the least restrictive environment possible and the right to attend school, um, as Dr. Ergun mentioned briefly when she talked about those terms. So next. Okay, so parents as advocates. When you think about the role that parents have when they're advocating for their child's special education needs, we really can kind of think of this role as a project manager. So when you think of what a project manager does, whether that be because they're managing a grocery store or a team with sports, what do we think that they do in that role? Well, they organize, they plan, they monitor progress, they anticipate problems, and they kind of keep the team focused and on track. That's kind of what a project manager does. We can kind of think of the parent as the special education advocate as this project manager. So what are the skills specifically for parents as advocates? So they're gonna learn new information, right? Which I already kind of briefly talked about. They're gonna learn information on their child's disability how that disability affects their child's ability to learn, familiarize themselves with special education law and procedures, and also be aware of the obstacles to advocacy and strategies to surpass those obstacles. They also are gonna master new skills. So they're gonna learn how to identify problems and offer solutions, as well as use facts and objective data 
data from the testing that they either get within the school or from an outside independent testing agency to support their requests, monitor their child's progress, and persuade school officials to provide certain services and accommodations if they don't feel like their child's getting the relationships specifically with their child's teachers the of and their the other school personnel on the child's IEP team um, because by establishing good working relationships Eddie, I think you're cutting off. Um, not sure if it's just me, but yeah, I know. Can you, can you hear? Can 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 people hear me? We can now, Eddie. But we you had went out, and you've done that a couple of times during the presentation. Um, if you'd like to maybe okay. go over this, um, it might be starting uh, with the um, mastering new skills. From that on, uh, I I think we couldn't hear the rest. Okay, but you can hear me now? Yes, we do. Okay, sorry, it must be my connection. I'm not sure. Um, so for mastering new skills, um, they're going to learn how to identify any problems and offer solutions, as well as use specific facts and objective data from either their child's testing or teacher observations to support their requests at the IEP meetings as well as monitor their child's progress and um, persuade school personnel to provide any services or accommodations that they feel like their child is not getting and that they need for their educational success. Um, and they're also gonna build relationships um, with their teacher, their child's teachers and other school personnel, essentially anyone else on that IEP team um, because good working relationships are really like the foundation for kind of getting those services by having those good relationships. Um, and then as you know, parents of children with FASD and other disabilities may know that taking care, taking on this role of being a parent's advocate can be very overwhelming. It can be tiring. It's a very long process that can consume a lot of time. So it's really important to also engage um, and some self-care for both yourself as well as your family to manage kind of all these other things that you're going to have to be doing throughout this process. Next. So what are some of the obstacles to successful parent advocacy? Um, so we kind of have three different categories of obstacles. The first one is just obstacles to advocacy in general. Um, the first one is inaccurate information. Um, so as I kind of mentioned, um, just because you receive information from someone at the school or an outside agency doesn't necessarily mean that it's accurate. Um, we want to really make sure that we're getting the correct information on our child's disability as well as like the special education processes and procedures so that we're advocating you know in the appropriate way based on the correct information um, as well as myths um, that are often the school has like myths about who learns best with what strategy um, why children are having trouble learning um, that maybe you're being overreactive about why you think your child may need this certain you know intervention or accommodation um, that then can prevent parents from like from advocating because they kind of give up or get discouraged um, so we just want to recognize that there are some myths that schools have about um, parents advocating for their children's educational needs um, there's also school obstacles that are really important to be aware of 
um, because school, every school has its own kind of culture or climate. Um, and this can sometimes serve as a wall that can prevent parents and school staff from working together um, and can be influenced by particular beliefs about um, children with learning problems or disabilities that principals or other school personnel may have, um, as well as the belief that the parent might be the problem or that school schools and the teachers are the experts and the parents aren't the experts. So just recognizing the attitudes um, that can stand in the way as obstacles. Um, and then there's also going to be obstacles within the system. So schools are bureaucracies and they do kind of have a power po totem pole. Um, so just uh, recognizing that teachers are kind of at the bottom of that totem pole and there's only so much power that a teacher has um, and just recognizing that um, because they do only have so much that they can do and advocate themselves for in the system that they're in. And then parent obstacles. So the main one is really going to be that lack of information and knowledge, whether that be about the child's disability, the educational needs that the child has or educational procedures or laws. So it's really important to make sure that, again, you have that accurate information, you educate yourself on all of those different pieces um, and recognize what you don't know and seek out sources to better um, acquire that knowledge. And then the second piece is emotions. So um, as many of you parents in the audience probably already know that you can experience a wide range of feelings about schools te schools and teachers when you don't feel like your child is getting the proper education um, such feelings as frustration anger anxiety sadness or even helplessness if you've tried and tried and tried and feel like you're not getting anywhere with the school um, and these feelings can be an obstacle if you don't learn how to control or manage them properly. Um, and you can also turn them into a strategy. So you can use them as a source of energy to keep going, um, but not letting them get in the way of advocating for your child. Next. So when we think of parents as experts. Um, we kind of have three broad categories that you really want to be an expert on because as we already talked about, you are the expert on your child's strengths and weaknesses and what they need. Um, but in order to advocate properly throughout this special education process, you really need to be knowledgeable about your child's disability, your child's educational needs, and how to monitor your child's educational process. Um, so I'm going to talk um, in a couple slides on how to do that. So the first is really becoming knowledgeable of your child's disability. So you want to make sure that you get a comprehensive evaluation, especially for your child with FASD. As I think another audience member asked, how do you get diagnosed? These are very, very comprehensive evaluations that normally need to be done by someone special, like a neurodevelopmental psychologist specializing in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and takes a medical provider, a psychologist, um, sometimes even like speech language occupational provider. So it's a very comprehensive evaluation and you wanna make sure that you're really getting the most accurate um, information from these evaluations that a lot of times the school evaluation may not be as comprehensive. So it's important to find outside providers um, that really specialize in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder diagnosis to make sure you're getting an accurate evaluation of their difficulties and their needs and how that translates into their classroom difficulties and educational needs. Um, so you want to find evaluators, again, who are knowledgeable about the child's disability um, and access any resources that you can in order to find those best evaluators. Um, we also really want to make sure that we understand the test results because a lot of times that's what's going to serve as benchmarks in the IEP process and specifically not only the academic results but as well as the results from the evaluation 
And a lot of times parents can feel confused about these test results. So it's important to, when you have a, normally there's a feedback session that you'll have with whoever did the evaluation and really going to that um, feedback session with questions so that you really understand how the results then translate into the child's educational experiences and how that will affect them in the classroom so that you can then take that to the IEP meeting and directly be able to explain this is what they found, the evaluator found, and then this is why we need this service or accommodation to help with this difficulty in the test results. Um, and again, having said that, the limitations of the school evaluation. So schools do a ton of these evaluations every single day, and they may not have someone doing the evaluations that have the expertise with FAS and FASD and diagnosing FASD. So that is another reason why it's really important to find an evaluator who does have that expertise. Um, and then you really wanna learn about the disability, which you guys, you know, parents in the audience, you're already here learning about a ton of different stuff related to FASD, um, specifically the child's learning, like how the disability affects the child's learning, which Dr. Ergun spent the whole first half of the presentation on. So really understanding how the difficulties associated with the disability influence the educational experiences of the student, and then a learning about effective educational practices. So that would have been what I kind of went over in terms of accommodations, effective teaching strategies, the different interventions and specific special education programs um, that help these difficulties. So that when you go to the IEP meeting, you have all that information with you. If the school and, and or the teacher is less knowledgeable, which Dr. Ergun also talked about how, especially with FASD, schools and teachers are not as knowledgeable about this stuff. So if you are, you're better able to advocate in those meetings and help them become aware of all the different services and accommodations out there that can be implemented into the IEP. Next. Um, so another important piece is monitoring educational progress because a lot of times it people you know IEPs can kind of get slipped through the cracks just in terms of teachers are having to monitor so many students IEPs and having to implement so many different you know keep on track of all these different things and so it's really your job to monitor your specific child's educational progress so that when you go to the IEP meeting you can you know have that information for why they need to stay on the IEP there might need to be make certain changes to the IEP add accommodations, take out accommodations. So what are some strategies to help with monitoring this? Because this can also be a lot for parents too, right? Um, so one thing is to have one master file um, because you're gonna have a lot of information that you take to these meetings. So having one big binder with even like the front of it, have creating a list, like a master list at the front of the binder with all of the different documents in your binder can be very helpful so that you know exactly where it is in your binder and you can easily access it. You know, when someone says, oh, you need to talk about this, you can, you know, pull out your binder and have the tab that is addressing what they're saying and you can pull it right out. So just having your documents in an organized fashion for yourself, which can look a number of different ways depending on the way you organize things, um, but making sure that it's there for you to access easily because you don't want to be stumbling to find your papers in these meetings. Um, the next is really measure, measuring educational changes um, throughout the year, whether that be, you know, students progression or regression. It's really important to be able to monitor both of those um, and you can do that by creating progress and regression charts as well as creating goals in the IEP that are specific and measurable which we're going to kind of get into with the SMART IEP so the acronym SMART stands for the S is specific, the M is measurable, the A is action words, the R is realistic and relevant and the T is time and in the next slide I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of those different components of the SMART IEP. Next. Maybe I wanted to see maybe um, if we have any questions. I know we talked a lot about advocacy, so it could be uh, of interest. So just wanted to check if there are any questions along the way. Um, there, was, there was a question, I kind of answered them 
one of the um, participants said in Ohio, we have surrogate parents for kids in care of the state, important to foster parents to know. Um, I answered her, but you might have another answer, Addie and Dr. Ergen is, I said, um, yes, it is very important. And the Ohio FASD Steering Committee partners with entities that represent this population. If you would like someone to present to a particular group, let us know. And I gave them the uh, 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 FASD mailbox. Do you have anything to add, ladies? Not from my side. I think you addressed that very well and how it relates to what we're doing in the committee as well and some of those efforts. And then um, she says, the same um, participant said she volunteers at the Summit County CASA and they forward or CASA forwarded this opportunity. She says she also vol volunteers with support team eight as a surrogate parent and she will share I will share your willingness to provide training anytime I have an ear of school personnel. And I said, awesome. told her that we partner, we collaborate with CASA. Yes, we do, definitely. Well, that's wonderful, uh, all the activities that you're um, definitely engaging in. And yes, we'd love to collaborate and even do more uh, within the school systems for sure. Anything else yeah, to I add? Yeah, I think she brings up a really good point that if parents don't feel like they can best, they don't have the time or the energy to serve mm -hmm. as this, you know, very intense advocacy, you know, role, that there are other resources out there to hire other partner with other advocate advocacy agencies and things of that sort to aid in the parents' efforts and advocating. So it doesn't have to be the sole effort by the parent. It really is a team effort and there are tons of resources both locally in Ohio and nationally for special education advocacy if that's something a parent wants to explore further and get more help in this process. And that's all the questions I have. And it looks like Stephanie Marino has her hand up. Um, I can try to unmute her again. Definitely. She's self-muted. So um, I guess if she does have a question, she can put it in the chat or unmute. I've unmuted. She'll need to put it in the question box. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't do it either last time, um, Alexis. I'm not sure what to do. But if she puts it in the question box, we can get it answered. Yep, that's yeah. it. All right, thank you. Eddie, you can go on. Okay, so what are SMART IEPs? So the S stands for specific. And so what that really is referring to is we wanna have specific goals and objectives in the student's IEP that really targets areas of academic achievement and functional performance. So whether that be um, behaviorally, emotionally, socially, those can also be goals and objectives in the IEP too, not just academic achievement. Um, and really we wanna include clear descriptions of knowledge and skills that will be taught to the student and how the child's progress will be measured. And that kind of leads us into the M of the SMART, which is measurable. And we want the goals and objectives not only to be specific, but to also be measurable, um, meaning that you can count or observe it. And this really can allow for both parents and teachers to objectively know how much progress the child has made since the performance was last measured. So it's very objective whether or not, yes, they're progressing or no, they're regressing. There is no kind of gray area when you have that reevaluation. Um, and then the A stands for action words. So when we are developing our goals and objectives in an IEP, we want to use action words. Um, and action words really have three parts. So the direction of the behavior, whether we want it to increase, to decrease, or maintain um, is one important component of that action piece. And then also then include the area of need. So we want reading, writing, social skills, transitions, communications, whatever that area of need is that we want to either increase, decrease, or maintain. So very specific and clear of which way we want the certain difficulty to increase, decrease, whatever that may be. Um, and then the level of attainment at which we want 
the student to achieve it at. So whether that be at a certain age level or grade level readiness in terms of reading or writing or math um, with or without assistance, because as Dr. Ergen mentioned, sometimes students with FASD may have um, like um, aides in the classroom who help them with like, who assist them with their stuff. But we wanna make sure that that's outlined in the IEP. Are they, you know, is our goal to meet this without having any assistance or still having assistance? Be very clear in that, in our wording. And then we also want the goals to be realistic and relevant um, and really address the child's unique needs um, that result from their FASD and not be based specifically on district or straight state testing or other external standards. So really having the standards for each individual child and what they're bringing in. And then we also want them finally to be time limited. Um, so what does the child need to know and be able to do after one year, after two years, after one month? So again, that can make it really easy to monitor progress and if they are or aren't reaching those goals outlined in the IEP. Next. Um, so here are just a couple tips for developing the IEP, keeping the SMART IEP components in mind. Um, so the IEP should really meet the child's academic development and functional needs that result from their FASD um, and enable the child to be involved and progress in um, whatever curriculum they're in. So whether that be the special education classroom or the general education classroom. Um, and we, can, we really want to use baseline data for present levels of performance. So using, again, that testing data, whether that be from the school evaluation or from the outside evaluation to base our progress on. Um, and then going back to the SMART IEPs, we want the objectives and goals to be measurable so that when we do have our reevaluations every th three years, we can determine how progress is or isn't being made. Um, and then we want to use objective data to make decisions and measure progress. Um, so whether that be the testing data or specific observations that teachers can count so that then they can, you know, measure it later. Okay, are they having 10 tantrums like before or are they now only having five emotional tantrums or are they acting out behavioral and we needed to remove them two times versus five times. So really having that objective data to compare um, progress too. Next. Um, so these are just some IEP advocacy tips. So um, what if your child is struggling and the school will not evaluate? Well, there's a couple things you can, can consider. So first you want to consider if what they're offering is appropriate. Um, and so after this presentation, right, you kind of have um, learned a couple um, classroom environments, the effective teaching strategies. So then you can kind of go back are teachers implementing this? Is what they're offering kind of in line with some of the um, practices that you've already learned about that have been found to be effective with these students? Um, you can also consider evaluation through an outside agency if the school will not evaluate so that you then have really objective data to take back to the school to then say, look, we got this evaluation from an outside source and they are saying that this child does have these difficulties and this is how they relate to the classroom. Um, you can also seek help from a school like advocate or another outside advocacy agency, which people have already talked about some different resources in Ohio to help foster parents and other caregivers if they don't feel like they can advocate properly. Um, and then the final thing would be to file a complaint or request mediation, um, which I'm going to talk a little bit about that process in the next slide. Um, and then if an IEP is not working, um, you can really consider how long it's been since services changed. Um, track project progress, like I mentioned, with really measurable goals so that you can easily show the progress to the teachers in the IEP meetings talk with the teachers, right? We want to establish that communication and really work as a team. It's not only important for teachers to recognize that, but also for parents to recognize that this is like an allyship and you are working with the teachers, not against them in this process. And then calling an IEP meeting would be the next step. Even before the three years, you are, are allowed to request um, and can definitely request an IEP meeting before that three-year evaluation if you do not believe that the teacher Teachers are meeting the IEP, what's laid out in the IEP. If it 
just whatever's you know outlined in the IEP in terms of accommodations and interventions is not working, you can call an IEP meeting sooner than the three years, which is also really important to, to know. Next. Oh, back one. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Back to the mediation and due process. Yes. Okay. So how do special education disputes, like how are these resolved? If you do have an IEP meeting and you know you aren't agreeing with what they want to put in the IEP where do you go from there well the next thing that you can do is um, file a complaint to the state education agency outlining um, like what you are struggling with and see if they can provide any assistance and if that if it can't be resolved um, between the parents and the teachers and the other members of the IEP team, the next step is mediation, um, which is a process that allows parties to resolve disputes without litigation. So there will be like a third party mediator that will come in and try to help the parent and then any other IEP team members that are, are you know, having the dispute without having to take it to like a legal, like a formal legal action. Um, but you should understand your rights and the law in mediation. And when you mediate, your real goal is to resolve the dispute and protect the parent-school relationship so it doesn't have to be taken to a due process hearing. However, if the parties aren't able to mediate, you do have the right as a parent under the IDA to call for a due process hearing. Um, these are conducted differently in different states. Um, but many of the procedures and timelines in a due process hearing are outlined under the IDA. So they're, if you look under the IDA, they're outlined specifically the procedures and processes you take for this due process hearing. Um, and what really happens after that is based on a whole bunch of different factors to, and, you know, the, the facts of the case, what the law says, um, how each attorney is are you know the preparedness of each attorney and then the person who makes the final decision is either the hearing officer or the administrative law judge so you won't have a jury in these cases um, it's not like a jury that will then decide which side wins it's that judge and so depending on their experience their biases you know what their perception is of the case they will make the final decision and then if you aren't happy with their decision, you also have the right to appeal that decision, which would kind of start that process over again. Um, in terms of the due process, you would have the appeal one, you can appeal one time, I believe, if you aren't happy with the outcome. So what are the common parent and school problems that may lead to a mediation? Um, so a lot of times teachers and parents might have different, different views of the child in terms of what are their strengths and weaknesses, what the child responds well to or doesn't respond well to. And it's really important to try to narrow this gap if we can, whether that be by openly communicating with the teacher or even writing a letter that describes your child and what you want for your child can be really helpful in this case. Um, another common problem is lack of information. Um, but either that, whether that be from the teacher side or the parent side, um, and I know Dr. Aragon talked about how schools and teachers lack a lot of information on the challenges students with FASD face, so that FASD face, so that can serve as a barrier. Um, and as I've talked about, lack of information can serve as a barrier to this entire process. So again, these webinars are meant to kind of provide some of that information to decrease that obstacle there. Um, lack of options. So although I talked about a lot of programs and interventions specifically designed to address the difficulties um, some students with FASD face, not all school districts or schools will offer these interventions. Um, there's just way too many disabilities that schools have to try to accommodate for, um, or that might not be an expert in your area that is willing to you know, have that intervention. Um, so that can be a problem and can be really frustrating for parents when you know of an intervention, but they're, they're not implementing it. And so what do you do next? Um, it's really trying to do your homework and collaborate with teachers and other 
school professionals in your district um, to try to find other options that are similar or other um, avenues to kind of get that those needs met. Um, and then feeling devalued, and this can be on both sides. So parents and teachers can be devalued throughout this process. And it's really important to keep that in mind, both from the teacher and the parent perspective. And just recognize that this is a process for both sides um, and really, again, wanting to work together to try to resolve any feelings of feeling devalued. Um, and then the next one is poor communication and intimidation. Like I talked about earlier, communication is really the, you know, the main foundation for these student success between the teachers and the parents. Um, and having poor communication can serve as a major obstacle. So um, having those strategies where you establish communi open communication early on in the school year can be really, really helpful to make it not as intimidating for both teachers to reach out to parents and parents to reach out to teachers. It's really a two-way street here. And then um, loss of trust, again, that can be from both sides. Um, but as a parent, if you lose trust and believe that the school doesn't know how to help your child, it can be really, really hard to kind of keep going and advocating. Um, and so in order to prevent from losing trust, right, we want to improve the relationships and taking those first steps to establish um, positive relationships between parents and teachers and schools. And I know I'm almost out of time. So other effective strategies, um, creating paper trails, like I mentioned, keep records of all letters, reports, and consent forms. Train yourself to write things down because if you ever do have to go to mediation or a due process hearing, it'll be really, really important to have those paper trails. Um, we wanna make sure we prepare for our IEP meetings. So organize and review files, brainstorm what you wanna say, have questions for teachers and the other IEP members, all of those things. Um, or effective strategies to have. Um, we also wanna make sure we maintain control during meetings. Some ways to help with this are to not go alone to the IEP meeting. So always either bring another parent, a friend, another advocate um, that can help with that. Tape record meetings. Um, you can use this to help control your anxiety and reduce fears, um, both of those strategies. And then writing evidence letters. Um, so not only reg letters to request, request information or request action, but also letters after meetings to document what was said, what happened so that it's all written down. And then finally, um, resources for parents. So in our handout that we sent out, the main resource page, we have a number of resources for parents as well as teachers. Um, as well as handouts for parents that have information on the special education process, um, different terms. I know I threw around IDA and um, IEP 504, but in that document, there's specific definitions um, in language that parents will understand, um, as well as um, a couple books on special education advocacy and tips for that process um, and other websites you can access for more information related to um, the special education advocacy process. And that's our references. Do we have any questions about that last piece? We do have a question. Addie, let me look, let me see. My child goes into the seventh grade in this fall. This fall, yesterday we reevaluated his IEP. The teachers had basic ideals for dealing with his delays, but little or no understanding of FASD. He quit school in October due to being online only. He has struggled to engage in school. He spends 20 minutes to one hour per day in school. The IEP did not address participation, engagement, or attendance. What would you recommend? Um, so you had the that so the IEP was reevaluated yesterday. Um, so I think what I would recommend, um, I don't know, it doesn't say in here. The teachers had basic ideas for dealing with delays, but no understanding of FASD. So I'm wondering if 
you have an outside evaluation that maybe you can take to an IEP meeting to present, you know, what some of the difficulties are. And then maybe, I guess what I would recommend is writing a letter saying, stating that you may want to have another IEP meeting. Um, and now that you've listen to this webinar and have some more of these this knowledge and resources going to the IEP meeting and really outlining some of these strategies that we've talked about that have been found to be effective with these students to see if they would be willing to implement any into the IEP plan. I don't know, Dr. Ergun, what you would recommend yeah. in this. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you, Addie, on um, requesting um, maybe a meeting first and then just kind of like going to the school and indicating that there has been, because when you say to quit school, that I'm I'm assuming maybe just doing online work, like uh, homeschooling. Um, so there has been a change of structure and that's actually a change of placement too. And change of placement, whether that's in a school or in a different format, uh, would require a, some kind of subtle or just some changes within, within the IEP. So it would be your right to um, go back to the school and indicate that he is struggling and he's not making gains. And some of the important areas such as attendance, participation, and um, how many hours he is supposed to be online were not outlined in the IEP. And therefore, you would like those uh, to be integrated and therefore revised um, in the IEP. So um, I think that would be a you know really helpful method. And I don't know if you have a uh, we can maybe, um, you know, have an advocate go in there with you to talk about these. You can bring in some of this information you had from the webinar uh, and um, asking for uh, a revision for the IEP would be the probably the best way to go so that your child uh, would continue to be successful. And she said, no, he quit. He said he's not going to school. This was our fourth meeting this term. Okay, so he's not going to school face to face that's I'm thinking, but then I'm thinking that he is continuing his schooling like at home. That's what I meant by homeschooling. Um, that's what I assumed, uh, I guess. She said not at all. I wonder if we can um, get her to. Yes, um, so not doing any school at all, uh, but I think there has to be, uh, I'm, I'm thinking some continuation of schooling because it's mandated as well. So, uh, and I, I do understand the, the struggles definitely. So even that part would be, you know, a, a way to kind of like uh, bring it up to the school and saying that because of the circumstances and uh, of the, what the school was not able to provide, my child is not able to continue their education, which is definitely of course an issue because we want no interruptions in their education. Therefore, going back to the school, um, you know, with an advocate to ask for some of the accommodations that, you know, you wanted, maybe could not get uh, before your child decided to quit, because it sounds like he was very overwhelmed and could not handle um, the situation anymore, because maybe some of the things that were supposed to be in there in the IEP were not included or provided. So, um, not to have an interruption, I would, you know, definitely suggest going back to the school with your own suggestions as to what do you think would be helpful for them to include into the IEP so that, you know, when your son, you know, tried to do it again, that he would want to go to school, whether online or, you know, face to face. And then one of our steering committee members is recommending, she said, one way for people to get just a second. She said one way for people to get to know the child and their views is the parent can help fill out the All About Me book. You can get this online. There are many different versions. There is also the FAS version on how they can explain what they struggle with. That's, that's a great uh, recommendation and a suggestion. Sometimes, yes, books and things in writing could be really helpful to start those difficult conversations because I can definitely sense there is a, that tension between the school, you know, and, and parent and um, the child. So um, those definitely break, you know, help to break that tension and then um, maybe ease some of those conversations that are definitely difficult. So I definitely hear you. 
And she says, thank you. That's all the questions we have. Do we have any live questions maybe? That could be a time to maybe also interact. Um, we understand it's over four, but um, I think we're happy to stay over as well to see if there are any live questions we can take as right. well. But if not, for those of you for time purposes, I'll let you close out, Karen. Um, Char, do you have any um, comments about the um, CEUs or anything to remind the participants about before we sign off? No, I don't. Okay. Just like I said, seven business days before the certificate will be sent out. They have any general questions or overall questions about the CE um, program or the FASD um, program for this today's training in particular, please send an email to the FASD mailbox. And remember that the survey won't um, reach you for about an hour and you should get it. If you could please fill it out and send it back to us, we'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much for giving them that last bit of information. Yeah. And um, without any further from me, we can close Dr. Erdin. Do you have your information at the end of your presentation that they can contact you with? Um, we have it at the very beginning. Uh, okay. Okay, that's okay. See. Not, then, um, I can put your e I can put it in the um, chat box. I yeah, mean, I'm not sure yet we have it. So if you wouldn't mind putting my uh, the, our email, um, and then I will forward the questions to Eddie as well. I guess we didn't include that. Um, so that please feel free to uh, reach out for more specific questions to both of us. And uh, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much for participating and attending today um, to talk about this you know, very important topic. And um, we look forward to having maybe some of you in the, in the next webinar to talk about stigma around um, FASD and some of the diversity and culturally relevant variables. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Ergen, we're going to um, schedule something to meet next week because everybody else um, is not available. But most people want to meet next week. Is that okay? okay. So uh, have you stopped the recording and everything? No, I think you have to. I'm trying to send a, um, put your, e I'm trying to put your um, email address in. Oh, the chat. Okay. Yeah. And then we can. Okay. Now, um, that's all I have. Um, we can email each other. Thank you. All right. Um, I think one of you guys have to. I can just find the um, the button to end. So if anybody, Char, um. You have that to end the recording. End webinar for all. I got it. Yes. Thank you. You're